based on the governor's executive orders, legislation adopted by the Virginia General Assembly, and the county board's continuity of operations ordinance adopted in March 2020. Before we begin, <clears throat> I have a few specifics to orient everyone to our virtual environment. Today's meeting is available as a broadcast with closed captioning on Comcast Xfinity channels 25 and 1085, Verizon Fios channels 39 and 40, and the county website. Audio of today's meeting is available via phone. If commissioners, presenters, or speakers lose their internet connectivity during today's meeting, please reconnect with us by phone. For presenters and speakers joining us through Microsoft Teams, please keep your phones and devices muted until you're called upon. Please turn off sound to other devices around you to minimize any interference. When called upon to speak, you must unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon located on your command bar. The moderator does not have the ability to unmute you. If you're dialing in by phone, press star six to unmute. Commissioners, our word for tonight is eggplant. If you wish to be recognized to speak, please unmute your microphone to signal your interest, and I'll call upon you in order. If you can use the raised hand icon, please do so. I like to see your faces when we have discussions, so you may keep your cameras on to facilitate our discussion when it comes to that time. Public speakers, you will be called upon by the clerk at an assigned time. Pre-registration to speak at the hearing was required and we're not able to accommodate additional speakers. Public comment will take place within the same time frame that we would provide in an in-person meeting. Speakers will have three minutes to comment as individuals and five minutes if representing an organization. A speaker timer will be display displayed on screen by the clerk. The meeting chat is active for presenters or commissioners who need technical assistance only. Do not use the meeting chat for discussions, public comment, or questions about agenda items. All public comment must be shared verbally for the record during the assigned public testimony period. Lastly, this is a public forum. Today's meeting will be recorded and posted to the county website. All information associated with today's meeting, whether written or spoken, is subject to Freedom of Information Act requirements. And with that, Madam Clerk, would you please call the first item? Madam Clerk? I'm so sorry, I didn't mute myself. Excuse me. Our first item for the evening are the amendments to the Planning Commission bylaws. It will be presented by our Vice Chair for Planning Commission, Commissioner Jim Lintelme. Thank you. Uh, good, thank you. Good evening, fellow commissioners. Um, this is partly a um, follow-up to our meeting last, our well, last meeting in September. Um, this agenda item is to to consider a change to our bylaws that we discussed at that meeting. Um, consistent with our bylaws requirements, I gave notice of these changes. Um, the two changes um, that we noticed would be changing um, Article 1, Section 2 to add the word equitably. The second one would be the deletion of Article 2, Sections 2 and 3, and a replacement with a new Article 2. Um, as a reminder, the uh, first one, um, um, I'll read through what, and I'll propose motions for both of them. Uh, the proposed motion, which contains the language I'm proposing, would be that I move the Planning Commission to revise its bylaws to change Article 1, Section 2 to read that the commission's purpose is to promote the orderly development of Arlington County, the county and its environs in order to equitably improve the public health, safety, convenience, and welfare of its citizens and to advise the county board on that subject. Now, this language keys off of the Code of Virginia Section 15.2-2210, uh, which essentially uses that same language and precedes the code section that mandates creation of the of planning commission. The change of language here is to add the principle of equity to our consideration of changes to our zoning ordinance and its application to projects submitted for our review under the comprehensive plan. I'm recommending the deletion of Articles 2, Sections 2 and 3, and I'll read what those two are. Uh, the Section 2 says all members of the commission shall be residents of the county. Section, section 3 reads, at least one half of members shall be owners of real property within the county. 
I'm recommending the deletion of these two sections for two reasons. Both of these sections simply repeat requirements for a planning commission's membership under the Code of Virginia, and they're thus redundant. But more to the point is Section 3, which has the effect of supporting structural inequity. Without getting into whether this was intentional, the requirement for a majority of real property owners as members under the Code of Virginia has the effect of having a pool of candidates that is disproportionately white. This disparity is the result of decades of federal and state laws and policies disadvantaging people of color in the purchase and holding of real property. Um, this has been documented in The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. Should the Code of Virginia change to eliminate this requirement, it would nonetheless survive as a planning commission requirement due to this bylaw provision. The substitute language would allow immediate change to our membership requirements with any changes to the Code of Virginia. With that, uh, the motion for that change would be, I move the Planning Commission to revise its bylaws to delete Article 2, Sections 2 and 3, and add a new Article 2, Section 2 to read as follows. Quote, membership shall be consistent with the Code of Virginia, unquote. Um, I now open it up for discussion to, to uh, among the commissioners. Um, excuse me, let me just clarify. Madam Clerk, did we have any public speakers on this item? We do not have any speakers on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Vice Chair Lynn, tell me. Yes, now we are open to discussion. Please do unmute or raise your hand icon. Let me know if you wish to speak. Oh, one thing actually that we point out that should we go ahead and vote to approve these changes, they will be immediately effective. Um, there's no, no further lag time. Um, they will be effective upon our vote. It's an, this is an internal to the commission matter. I'm having trouble seeing whose hands are raised. Can I get some technical assistance? Can anyone hear me? Yes. Um, okay, I apologize. Um, I'm R Reginald Nixon here to speak on the agenda item three. Yes, we will call you at that time. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Thank you. I see Tenley's uh, hand is raised. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Lynn. Tell me, Commissioner Peterson. Um, hi, thank you so much, Commissioner Lantelmi. Um, I had a question uh, during our last hearing. Uh, one of my fellow commissioners brought up the point about um, if the Code of Virginia continues to require land ownership um, or property ownership, do we want to um, do we want to allow that, or do we want to go one step farther and say that we do not require? Uh, property ownership um, for a certain percentage of our uh, membership? Well, we are bound by the Code of Virginia. So even if we say that, um, it will not, it can't overrule the Code of Virginia. Um, should that provision be deleted in the Code of Virginia, we automatically will not need to follow that, um, whether, we just, whether we have it in our bylaws or not. It becomes no longer operative. So stating it in the bylaws, um, it would be contrary to, at this point, it would be contrary to the Code of Virginia and would not be offered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions from the commissioners? Oh, by the way, this language, I have uh, run it by the, um, and discussed it with the county attorney, um, and he has no objections to it. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. McIsaac, if you're watching from afar. Okay. Seeing no other interest in discussion, I think we're ready for a motion. Okay. Um, the first one, I move that the Planning Commission revise its bylaws to change Article 1, Section 2, to read that, quote, the Commission's purpose is to promote the orderly development of Arlington County, Corrin County, on Corrin, and its environs in order to equitably improve the public health, safety, convenience, and welfare of its citizens, and to advise the county board on that subject, unquote. Do we have a second? Second. 
I'm sorry, was that Commissioner Hughes? It's Commissioner Schroll. Thank you, Commissioner Schroll. Moved by Commissioner Lantelmi, seconded by Commissioner Schroll. Any discussion? Commissioner Siegel? Yes. Um, can uh, Commissioner Lantelmi, do, do you have a copy of the current um, provision that you could read? Uh -huh. And then if you wouldn't mind, could you could you reread re your uh, proposal? Um, sure. Um, actually, it's the exact same language uh, currently without the word equitably. Okay. Uh, I thought there was a qualifier. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't have that language in front of me. I thought there was um, um, a an adjective in the earlier language um, suggesting um, stability or, or something like that. Maybe if you would just read your motion um, once you, again, you, do you mind? Sure. Sure. Um, I move that the Planning Commission revise its bylaws to change Article 1, Section 2, to read that, quote, the Commission's purpose is to promote the orderly development of Arlington County, paren, the county on paren, and its environment, in order to equitably improve the public health, safety, convenience, and welfare of its citizens, and to advise the county board on that subject. Um, right. Commissioner Siegel, I think what you're remembering is way back when I was circulating some earlier language that was modified after my discussions with the county attorney. Uh, I think the word was orderly that I had I had missed. I, I just wanted to make I just wanted to understand what was being changed. And I got it now. So okay. thank you. And I was wondering somebody I'm hearing somebody typing um, could manage me. Oh, it's you. Me. Thank Type you. away. Type away, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did that answer your question? Commissioner Siegel. Yes, I'll indeed. Start. It did. Excellent. Seeing no other interest in discussion, we are ready for a vote. Um, all in favor, and I will call you in order. Commissioner Lantelmi? Aye. Commissioner Bagley? Aye. Commissioner Hughes? Aye. Commissioner Morton? Aye. Commissioner Patel? I'm mute. Commissioner Patel? She'll be running a little late. Thank you. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sarley? Uh, aye. Commissioner Schroll? Aye. Commissioner Siegel? Aye. Commissioner Steinberger? Aye. Commissioner Weir? Aye. Commissioner Guerin? Aye. The motion passes 11, one absent. Commissioner Lynch, tell me, did you have another motion? Yes, I do. Um, I move that the Planning Commission revise its bylaws to delete Article 2, Sections 2 and 3, and add new Article 2, Section 2 to read as follows. Quote, membership shall be consistent with the Code of Virginia, unquote. Do we have a second? This is Tenley. I'll second. Thank you. Motion by Commissioner Lantelmi, seconded by Commissioner Peterson. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we're ready for a vote. And I'll go in the same order. Commissioner Lantelmi? Aye. Commissioner Bagley? Aye. Commissioner Hughes? Aye. Commissioner Morton? Aye. Commissioner Patel, I assume, is still not with us? Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sarley? Aye. Commissioner Schroll? Aye. Commissioner Siegel? Aye. Commissioner Steinberger? Aye. Commissioner Weir? Aye. Commissioner Guerin? Aye. The motion passes uh, 11 with one absent. Uh, thank you very much, Vice Chair Lynn, tell me for taking this on, and thank you to County Attorney Steve McIsaac for helping us with that. Uh, I understand the next steps are that Ms. Johnson will make this change for us on our web page, so I want to thank uh, Ms. Johnson for that as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, with that, Madam Clerk, would you please call the next item? Item number two is site plan number 76, the Arlington Hotel Holdings, which we know as Park Arlington, located at 1200 North Courthouse Road. We have Adam Watson and Jane Kim to present this item this evening. 
Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Watson and Ms. Kim. Thank you and good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay, and I hope that you can see my presentation as well. Yes. Okay, perfect. So this is the Park Arlington at Courthouse Site Plan Amendment to Site Plan 76. So this site is located about two blocks south of the Courthouse Metro Station uh, in the Clarendon Courthouse Civic Association area. The site is outlined here on this image uh, in blue and with the yellow star. And um, it is an existing hotel structure located at 1200 North Courthouse Road. So to go briefly over the background here, this was a residential building that was constructed by Wright in the early 1960s. It became officially site plan 76 in the late 70s, being separated from a sister project immediately to the south, which is the Bell Apartments today, the site plan 75. It was administratively converted to a hotel use in 1980 because the existing zoning at the time allowed for such a thing to occur. In 2005, most recently, there was a site plan amendment to reduce the hotel density, uh, to augment the site plan area for this site, taking some from, again, the adjacent site to the south and for a couple modifications of the zoning ordinance as well. Moving on to speak briefly about the general land use plan and the zoning, the key takeaway here is that the GLUP and the zoning are not changing. They are remaining the same and they are both consistent. So the site is GLUPed medium residential and REH hotel district. In terms of the proposal overview, this is a relatively straightforward site plan application. It's to convert the existing building from hotel to residential use. Um, we expect for this building to likely be condominium based on our discussions with the applicant. The density is decreasing by seven guest units. So it's going from 187 guest rooms down to 180 dwelling units. The parking is also being reduced overall by a total of three parking spaces for a parking ratio proposed at 0.83 spaces per unit. Some additional changes include increased landscaping and screening, particularly around the perimeter of this site, improved pedestrian connections, including widening of an existing pathway behind the building on the western uh, portion of the site, reduced surface parking, and some facade updates as well. Zoning ordinance modifications include reducing the parking ratio below the um, required amount that's standard for this district, which is 1.125 spaces per unit, increased compact parking above 15% and increased lot coverage above 50%. Speaking briefly about the policy guidance that guides um, staff's review of this site, this site is um, in the courthouse station area and it does fall under the courthouse sector plan addendum. However, it is not a, a key redevelopment site, was not identified as such in the plan addendum and so therefore there's really no site-specific guidance provided in this document aside from the fact that density consistent with the existing GLUP is uh, an acceptable and appropriate amount of density for this site and again those not those not changing. The Roslyn Boston corridor streetscape standards also apply to this site. 13th Street and Courthouse Road are both identified frontages in those standards. However, this is really a standard that guides sites where you're having full redevelopment. There are some deviations from what's proposed in the standards in terms of the overall clear width and the location of the tree pits. However, staff believes that these are acceptable deviations given the scope of this project, a number of existing utility conflicts and recent VDOT improvements to the frontages, including and in particular along Courthouse Road, which was um, completely re replaced, um, including new sidewalks, street lights, and retaining wall placed uh, circa 2014 or 15. We also just want to note that 12th Street or 12th Court North does comply with the standards. The off street parking guidelines um, also apply to this site. The site is eligible for reduced parking as low as 0.3 spaces per unit for market rate units. Um, the applicant, again, is, is requesting a modification to reduce to 0.83 spaces per unit, which we think is acceptable and appropriate given the site's proximity to Metro, which again is about 1,000 feet. And then lastly, the master transportation plan. 
Um, in this case, we're looking particularly for guidance in terms of the amount of surface parking to remain on site. Of course, the MTP does discourage retaining off street surface parking, particularly between the sidewalk and the front of the building. So the work with uh, that staff has been engaged in over the last six months has been working with the applicant to mitigate this further. And I'm going to walk through that a little bit here over the next couple slides. So to try to summarize briefly the project evolution over the last nine months, hopefully you'll be able to see most of the um, <laughs> colors on my on my slide here. But the first thing that we wanted to work with the applicant on was re reducing or eliminating as much surface parking as possible, especially given that guidance in the NTP. So over the course of the last couple of months, the applicant has agreed to remove 21 surface parking spaces, 11 from the front and 10 from the back. Um, so there is, a, there is a, a positive improvement in terms of surface parking reduction. In green, what we've shown are the increased landscaping, screening, and biophilic elements that have been added in some cases in place of existing certain um, surface parking. Sort of hand in glove with that, we've asked for reduced impervious surface area and improved stormwater management. Uh, most recently, working with the applicant to introduce um, permeable paving in the front lot, which is adjacent to North Courthouse Road. And that strip that's highlighted there in yellow, the applicant has agreed by way of condition to treat this with permeable pavements about 4,000 square feet, which will further help um, mitigate stormwater runoff and um, control pollution. In blue, we were very concerned, again, throughout SPRC, this was raised as well about having safe pedestrian connections to the front of the building, which is near the, the portico share uh, on the front end of the site um, off North Card House Road. So the applicant has agreed to create, shown in blue here, sort of curving with the arc of the face of the building, a protected raised sidewalk that will allow um, a pedestrian to get from either North Court, um, sorry, 12th Court North, or from Courthouse Road, from the sidewalks there to the front of the building. Another good improvement. Lastly, the applicant has proposed to improve and widen the pedestrian pathway shown in red along the western frontage of the building and has agreed by way of condition to grant a private access easement to the neighboring properties who customarily use this path. That's the, the condominiums to the south as well as the Bell Apartments to the south across the street. In terms of community engagement, we did have one SPRC before the COVID-19 crisis began. That was in February. Um, in March, we were planning to have another SPRC that was ultimately canceled. However, the revised materials from the applicant and the revised staff report from staff were posted online. In July, the county board did defer action of this item at the request of the applicant to October, which is where we are now, of course. So the transportation, excuse me, the transportation commission did hear this item last Thursday, October 1st, um, and it was unanimous approval of the county manager's recommendation. We're at planning commission tonight, of course, and then we'll be going to the county board on the 17th of this month. So I just wanted to highlight briefly some of the site plan features and improvements coming with this project. I've mentioned most of them already. Uh, the improved pedestrian connections with the private access easement along the back side of the site which is again a, con a condition the applicant has agreed to. New internal sidewalk along the front of the site, um, new permeable paving to help mitigate stormwater uh, and reduce the overall impervious surface area, reduced overall surface parking, increased landscaping, vegetative screening and stormwater management. And then I just wanted to also point out that the applicant has agreed to a number of standard conditions that are really more typical for a full redevelopment project, including a number of sustainability elements, uh, full transportation, transportation demand management plan, public art fund contribution, utility undergrounding contribution, mm -hmm. and in building wireless for the first responders network. So our recommendation tonight to the planning commission is that you adopt the county manager's recommendation, which is to adopt the subject site plan amendment subject to the conditions of the staff report. We believe that this um, is, a, is an overall improvement to the site and it really brings a 1960s site design that is a, an adaptive reuse of a building into better alignment with current county policies. And pending your question, that concludes my briefing. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Madam Clerk, do we have an applicant presentation? 
We do. Nicholas Cummings with Walsh Colucci here on behalf of the applicant. I think we want to give Kathy Taylor a moment to pull up the presentation if we can get her control. Um, I'm going to start off with saying that I think Adam really covered this in a very thorough manner. Um, I had some stuff written here that I would have read, but I think that I'm going to skip over a lot of it in general. We're excited to bring you the proposed conversion of this existing aging hotel into a condominium building. Our big goal here was to provide housing at relatively lower price points that would appeal to a larger pool of buyers, including first-time home buyers. So in support of that goal, we sought to reuse the existing structure, but substantially renovate it with architectural upgrades to the facade and other interior improvements. You heard from Adam about reduction of parking. We redesigned the um, interior garage to increase the number of spaces there using um, an increased number of compact spaces. Uh, committed to a number of green building elements that we're really excited about. We have improved stormwater uh, facilities on site. The additional of the permeable pavers helps that too. That's all in excess of Virginia requirements. Um, with all of that, I'll then move to the presentation. I see that it's up, which is wonderful. Now it's gone. <laughs> We're going to run through a couple of renderings. That's okay. Okay. Put We're living thing. in a new world together. This is my first remote planning commission hearing, I think, unless I had one in the spring that I've forgotten. Well, thank you, Mr. Cummings. Did I get in the way of something? We were trying to show a presentation, so could we give Kathy Taylor control and she'll oh. run through some renderings. Can you give her control back, Matt or Adam, please? Hey, Nick, this is Adam. If you want me to, I can run the presentation that I it. have. Is, is, would that be fine? Yep. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Watson. Hey, you can't see the clock. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll be on. quick, I promise. Oh, hold on, I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm unable to to share this for some reason. I saw it a moment ago. Yeah. Is that there it? There it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Let's go to the first page. Next Thanks, page, Nate. please. Yep. All right, so this is the existing building uh, from North Courthouse. Um, notice that there's really a lack of plantings in the parking lot area. Um, also the aging, uh, you know, facade design, the windows are old, the patios are old. Let's go to the next slide. Here you can see a vast improvement. We have the refinished facade, installed new windows, uh, new balcony elements. Also, you can really see the increased number of plantings once those trees reach maturity. That's going to help shield the existing parking lot, um, the portion of it which still remains after this. Let's go to the next slide. All right, here we have the entrance to the garage, again, obviously the existing building, and you can see the entrance to the current hotel. This is also a great vantage point from which to see the uh, lack of biophilic elements and plantings within the existing parking lot. Uh, go to the next slide. All right, here now we can see the new pedestrian pathway, a new sidewalk directly to the front entrance of what will be the condominium building, but also an excellent vantage point at the parking lot after it is fully redesigned with the new biophilic elements, all the plantings and the permeable pavers would be underneath that first row of parking there that you see in the foreground. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is the rear of the building, as I would call it, on 13th Street North. This is where the pedestrian pathway behind the building uh, terminates up at 13th Street North. And you can see how it's close to those dumpster enclosures. Uh, we have no street trees here and obviously the aging building still. Let's go to the next slide. A huge improvement here. You can see not only have the windows been replaced, the facade redone, uh, the dumpsters relocated in a better location away from the pedestrian path, but also the pedestrian path itself. You can see the boardwalk, it's clearly marked. It's no longer that sort of informal goat path behind the building, but something that we've developed into a real place where people can walk and feel safe. And of course, the addition of the street trees uh, where there previously were none. Let's go to the next slide. Here, I just wanted to quickly highlight, we've got some more biophilic elements, more plantings uh, on this rooftop amenity space for the residents. You can go to the next slide. All right, Jeff, go ahead. 
Good evening. This is Jeff Kreps from VICA. Hope you all can hear me. Uh, yeah. Most of this ground has been covered, but I will hit a couple of the highlights. Uh, three things, pedestrian circulation, as you can see, highlighted in orange here, the enhanced circulation. Um, the broad arc along the front of the building, of course, connecting to Courthouse Road. As Nick mentioned, the uh, 13th Street North will be left largely in its current configuration, but rebuilt with the new you know, to new county standards. And then if we go to the next slide, I think you'll see this is sort of the proposal for the enhanced uh, pathway along the west side of the building, which gives us an opportunity to create a, a more of a boardwalk feel back there, really install a lot of plant material, uh, native plant material, shrubs and trees to help really liven that area up. Uh, next slide. So this is the existing condition. And if we flip back and forth between this one and the next one, there's a couple other things that I wanted to talk about briefly. Stormwater management and enhanced landscape arc landscape design, if you will. So there's a few things that we're doing from a stormwater perspective. The big one being the removal of the 21 spaces. Uh, again, 11 being removed from that central area of the parking lot that you can see right in the middle of your screen. And then 11 on the back side of the building uh, on the north side. So we're taking 10 more spaces out of there. So a total of 21 spaces removed, replaced with landscape. Um, and then the addition of the permeable pavers along that long rectangular row that fronts Courthouse Road. So those couple things are both will help to reduce stormwater runoff. Uh, the plan is also to amend the soil that we, when we, take the asphalt out and put the new landscaping area in, we're going to amend that soil to a DEQ spec that gives us a much better soil quality, will help with infiltration, and overall just increase the, the quality on site. Um, next slide. So lastly, this is the proposed landscape. As we mentioned, kind of where the pink trees are is the primary focus of, you can see the, the central island that's been enhanced, with a walkway in the center, so the people who park in that newly configured central island will have a, a you know a protected pathway to get from the island to uh, through the portico shared into the building, um, and then we've got a lot of enhanced planting on the on the what's the west and the north side. Uh, one of the other things we mentioned briefly, there is a lot of turf on the site already, and so one of the things we've agreed to do recently. Um, is to replace all of that turf with uh, native plantings. So it does a couple of things. It reduces the overall water demand of the site because turf is irrigation intensive, as you know. Uh, so by installing a native plant pallet, we can both reduce the overall water need from the site as well as uh, help increase uh, infiltration and also just increase the biodiversity on site, which, as we all know, uh, will help sort of further the county's goals of uh, biophilic design. And it will give anybody who happens to be walking through the area uh, a much needed respite from what is around them. So in a nutshell, that's what we've done. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that might come up. There may be one more slide, I think, which is just a summary. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cummings, and thank you, Mr. Krebs. So we've completed the presentations, correct? Um, with that, then, I, we will go to public comment. Madam Clerk, do we have public comment for this item? We do. Uh, let me give one second so I can put my screen back up. Thank you. Sure. Oh, yes. Stop this. Go back to the clock. Okay. All right. Our first and only speaker, as shown, is Dr. Bernie Byrne. Yes, hello. Welcome, Mr. Byrne. We can hear you. You have three minutes. Okay. I just have some minor points. It's about the up the landscape plan, which was presented, which he, which is a good idea because he, they, they are making it biophilic. 
But the point is really it's to really make it ah. biophilic the way it should be, the, the, the planting species kind of have to be changed. They're mostly going to be, according to their their their, their um, picture on L O one L dash O one. That's on their landscape plan, their site plan. It's it's mostly going to have evergreen trees and and bushes, things like that. These are while they are better than pavement and mowed grass. It's really not good enough. You really want to have pollinator plants uh, in there because after all, that we, that is biophilic. And uh, the, mon the county does have a monarch pledge, which they put in 2016, 2016, that really has not been implemented. And that, that monarch pledge is to establish pollinator areas. Th there's no reference of this here. So you'd think about replacing some of those shrubs and everything else with, po with pollinator areas. They talk about native plants. Well, that should include the trees. They should be native, too. Uh, you know, not just Selkovis, which aren't native. Uh, the idea is make this thing really biophilic on, on that landscaping. Uh, so, so again, pollinated plants, milkweeds for monarch, so monarch butterfly re reproduction, preferably that one species, common milkweed, it called Asclepius syriaca, which that's the only one that will really grow well in Arlington. And, and uh, you know, but the big thing is milkweed, uh, other pollinated plants, uh, native trees. Uh, that's what makes biophilic. So although they have the right idea, that they, they really it would be very nice if they just really did it the right way. They'll, very often, the landscape planners don't realize this of what it really takes to make something really biophilic. You can see this in our parks, things like this. So it, they don't often have the right kind of milkweed, things like that. So that's what I have to say. But for, I, I would request that they, that they they probably don't have the final landscape plan yet, but for what it's showing, it's just not showing that kind of a, 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 a biophilic planting. That's about it. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. I appreciate those comments. Um, and there's no other public comment. So with that, did we? are there any other commissions in attendance who wish to speak to this item? I'm going to assume none then. Commissioner Lynn, tell me, did Transportation Commission want to give a report on this? Uh, yes. Um, we considered this at last Thursday's Transportation Commission. Um, the two areas that were the focus of the discussion were pedestrian circulation and the parking ratio. Um, the pedestrian circulation met with approval for the addition of the sidewalk to the front entrance from Courthouse Road. Uh, we also discussed um, a good deal about the easement along the west side of the property um, and how that would operate. Um, as the uh, Transportation Commission was satisfied with what the applicant was proposing here. Um, I think that, that it will work. It's definitely an improvement over what is there now um, and preserves the neighborhood's ability to uh, walk up the hill to the, to the metro. Um, for parking, uh, the, there's a recognition that the ratio is a little bit high given how close we are to the metro station here. But there's also the recognition that this is an adaptive reuse of an old property um, and that um, this will be a condominium rather than a rental unit. Uh, those two factors were sufficient to give the Transportation Commission um, um, its, its approval of, of a 0.83 ratio. Um, we were comfortable with that and the vote was unanimous to recommend this project to the county board um, as, as recommended by staff. Thank you very much, Commissioner Lantami. Um, we're ready for a PC report. Commissioner Morton shared this with Commissioner Siegel co-chairing. Commissioner Morton, um, thank you for your excellent written report. Would you give us the oral report right now and include where you think we should focus our discussion? Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you again to Jane Siegel for being my ABLE co-chair in this project. So as has been discussed already, uh, SPRC met only once on February 3rd, 2020. Um, and the second uh, meeting was uh, canceled because of the COVID pandemic. I'm going to just briefly uh, go through a few highlights of the report I have already circulated and then raise uh, some questions for discussion. So um, in general, uh, a couple of the overall uh, areas of consensus uh, at SPRC one, there was general enthusiasm that a building was being repurposed and that the proposed new use uh, was residential. 
uh, SPRC members did express their hope that the units might provide affordable housing opportunities um, that are less typical of new construction, especially along the Ros La Roslyn Boston corridor. Uh, SPRC members generally praised the building and thought it was a nice approach, uh, that it refreshed uh, the building and, and still maintained the uh, architectural character. Uh, there were some requests for more consideration of sustainability and green features like solar panels and green roofs. I know the applicant did address that in their second presentation. Um, and uh, maybe we can talk about that further later. Uh, there were a number of uh, issues of concern uh, discussed during SPRC. Um, site and design, uh, as I said in the report, this building, along with most of its contemporaries, was really constructed with this very strong automobile orientation. Uh, this isn't a project we'd be enthusiastic about today if it came forward as a new project. Um, and be largely because of that orientation, SPRC members did raise a number of concerns uh, about the uh, overall circulation, the pedestrian friendliness, uh, the accessibility issues. Um, as you've heard, one of the uh, significant ch uh, changes the applicant has made to address that has been this internal sidewalk, um, along with some of the other um, vegetation and landscaping. There was a considerable amount of discussion about the pedestrian path on the western edge of the site. Uh, SPRC members expressed their strong desire that this path remain open um, and that it become uh, a more safe and physically attractive environment. Um, as uh, staff has noted, this isn't covered specifically in the courthouse sector plan addendum. Uh, nonetheless, that plan does call for the creation and improvement of pedestrian connections between courthouse court and residential neighborhoods um, and the general objective of a convenient, safe, and physically attractive pedestrian circulation system. Um, there were inquiries uh, from SPRC members about things like lighting and access, and maybe we'll discuss that a little bit more when we discuss the nature of the path. Uh, the second main issue was parking, which has been covered by both uh, staff and applicant. In general, SPRC members were supportive of the reduced parking ratio, although we did hear a little bit of community concern um, about uh, crowded adjacent streets. Um, and despite the fact that this is a reduction, there were SPRC members concerned, uh, as Commissioner Lentelmi has uh, suggested, about the relatively high ratio close to a metro stop. A uh, particular concern was the amount of surface parking, which is discouraged by the MTP. Um, with respect to streetscape and landscaping, the final issue, um, as staff has noted, this does deviate a bit from the Roslyn Boston corridor streetscape standards. Um, there wasn't so much discussion of this specific um, issue. Nonetheless, there was a lot of um, concern expressed about the um, vegetation and desire for vegetation to provide both visual relief and to promote sustainability and biophilic principles. So um, with all that, uh, I am planning to support the county manager's um, proposal specifically as conditioned uh, by the condition number 57 and 58, which we'll probably discuss. And I had a few possible topics for discussion. Um, the first is what contemporary guidance and policies are relevant to an adaptive use uh, conversion? Uh, this may be discussed best uh, in a holistic way at LRPC, and I see that there is a meeting about office conversion uh, next week. Um, nonetheless, I think it's germane uh, in a particular um, uh, project like this. Um, the second item for discussion uh, is the quality of the proposed streetscape and associated project improvements uh, in sufficient alignment with the Roslyn Boston quarter streetscape standards. With respect to site design, I think uh, it could be interesting to talk about the function and design of the pedestrian pathway, um, signage, lighting, interface with residential units. 
uh, whether the private easement agreement is sufficient to ensure access by the public, um, how will the users be monitored, uh, perhaps some elaboration of accessibility issues since we didn't get to discuss that fully. Uh, with respect to transportation, uh, parking ratio and surface parking may be a good uh, topic for discussion, as well as the adequacy of the visual and environmental mitigation in the two parking lots. Um, finally, an elaboration of sustainability features and biophilia could be appropriate since we really didn't get into much detailed discussion uh, during SPRC. So that's my report. Happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner Moore. An excellent report, and thank you for teeing up the discussion topics. Um, commissioners, if you would like to add anything that doesn't fall under one of those five major categories, and you can see these on Commissioner Morton's written report, let me know, and then we'll get started with our discussion. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands up. Excellent. Then we'll start with our discussion. Um, first, uh, Mr. Watson, I do want to thank you for the slide presentation you gave us. The slide with the colors on it was, in fact, quite legible and helpful. Um, let's start with your first point, Commissioner Morton. What contemporary guidance and policies are relevant to an adaptive, adaptive use, use conversion? Who would like to speak to that issue? And commissioners, do use the raise hand icon if you can. Otherwise, I'll look to see if you've unmuted. Um, Commissioner Steinberger, and then Commissioner Siegel. Um, so first, I want to thank. Can you all hear me? Yes. And do you want me on video? I can. I can yes. see you. I prefer if I can see you when you talk. Thank you. Now I'm on video. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Apologies for that light directly behind my head. Um, so first, I want to thank Commissioner Morton because I I think that um, it's very important to consider the broader idea of sort of what policies we do want to have in place when we're talking about an adaptive use and conversion. Um, I think that's important. Um, I'm personally thrilled that this is an adaptive reuse um, for this structure. Uh, I'm actually fairly familiar with that building and have attended a couple conferences there years ago. Um, you know, as, as we look to kind of what we want our county services we provide as a county to kind of look like going forward, it's important to consider not just building new, but also what we can do with existing structures. Um, so I, I think from kind of a, so my first point is simply I'm very excited and kind of pleased to be having that conversation. I do think that um, in the context of office conversions, and I know we're going to have a meeting on that kind of coming up. Um, um, it, even maybe more so now with such a large population working from home and probably a, a significant portion of those folks now working from home may never go back into an office because I think that's sort of the, the movement we're going to be taking. What else we can do with space that is or was offices or was intended to be offices and what that kind of, what resources we as a county want to kind of direct towards uh, other uses that have an, a positive impact on the community. Um, I, I, I think that office use is probably going to be one of the areas that I'm kind of seeing where that's happening because I think the number is going to drive that. Um, so I, I am curious to kind of uh, have that as a conversation. I do think LRPC is the appropriate venue to kind of start having the conversation. Um, I think that was another point that Commissioner Morton raised. So. Um, I just wanted to, to throw my kind of weight behind that. And I would, for one, be interested in sort of having a a fulsome conversation and kind of a somewhat free ranging, at least initially, to kind of come up with some of those topics. Because I think that for myself personally, I, I think there's a lot I still want to learn and see what we can hear kind of big ideas before we drill down. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Steinberger. Commissioner Schroll, I believe, is chairing that meeting, and I'm sure he's keeping track of these comments. Um, thank you. Commissioner Siegel? Yeah, um, going through the, um, the meetings and the information, uh, the back and forth, um, watching the um, site plan and the, particularly the public spaces um, 
around the building uh, kind of <clears throat> come into focus and, and be improved. And, and I think it's much improved from what we saw originally. Um, I, I did have a question basically for staff. Um, I know we're discussing this generally now, but my question uh, of was more for staff. There's no, but some com com uh, confirmation of that. The really for an adaptive reuse of this sort, uh, from hotel to apartment, I guess any adaptive re reuse, um, are there explicit policies uh, that come into play? Uh, or is this more like, and this is really a question for Adam, I think, is this more uh, like what I observed, uh, which was um, how could we bring the public space um, around the building uh, to a standard um, that would be consistent with, in a broad sense, the kinds of urban uh, design and urban amenities that we we want to see and that we do see in plans and in in actual redevelopments. So I, I wanted staff to to uh, respond to that. Thank you, Commissioner Siegel. Can I ask those of you who are not part of the discussion right now to please turn off your cameras, members of the public? When um, when you speak, I would like to see you. But right now, uh, it may be interfering with our technical abilities. Mr. Watson, can you address Commissioner Siegel's points? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I think I may have missed part of the question, but my general understanding of it, it was about the policies that we're looking at for adaptive reuse. And I think, you know, the answer is it, it really depends. Yes. Yeah, it really depends, uh, you know, on the site location. The first thing we're going to do is for a specific site, go back and look at what adopted plans and policies are applicable based on the geography. So that's what we did here. And, you know, there are some there are some areas of the county where there may be very specific guidance about what use is appropriate in a given area. For example, Crystal City Sector Plan, um, which which may have a certain percentage or use mix for a given block. Uh, you know, of course, here that that was not the case. This actually is the hotel district, uh, and this building um, was originally a was a, originally a residential building, and now it's going back. And those are those are the two types of uses that are approvable and appropriate given the existing zoning. So it's a really a matter of going back to the adopted policies that we already have in place to look to see what um, guidance there is on um, use conversion. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Ms. Commissioner Siegel, yeah, go ahead. Just, just to follow up, um, I, I guess you also applied the, the streetscape standards, and although there are some derogations from it, um, the, 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 um, the ultimate product seems to come closer to, uh, it's not exactly, but consistent with the, the streetscape standards, um, the, the sort of push for more green and biophilic treatment. Um, uh, that that was also part of this, and I think that was part of your negotiation with the applicant. Is that correct, Mr. Watson? Yeah, correct. I, I mean, again, we were generally looking for them to get as close as possible to the corridor standards, but in addition to that, thinking again about how can you mitigate some of the uh, facets of this project that don't really comply with county policy today, and so screening and increasing the amount of, um, of biophilic treatment landscaping and reducing impervious surface area, all of the above were were things that um, we identified as being important. Um, and, you know, if the if the tree um, pits and the beds where they exist today aren't going to be relocated to the back of the curb, then what can be done to increase the amount of landscaping there and screening to make it overall uh, mo both more visually appealing and also more environmentally friendly? Great. That, that's what I thought. That's what I observed. But I do have one more quick question about, and I, and I don't think we got any information, at least that I'm aware of, uh, during the discussions, um, the SPRC discussions. Uh, what, maybe this question for the applicant, 
what about the, the heating system, the heating cooling system? Um, I know there, there was no discussion with um, the green building staff. I know that uh, a lot of the appliances will be, oh, I guess I should show my face. Uh, the appliances, <laughs> sorry. Ooh. Thanks. Tricky. The, the appliances are water sense and um, that sort of interior renovation. But I think we talk about um, the, the um, it's an older building. Uh, is there are there any upgrades in terms of uh, the energy use in the in the building for heating and cooling, et cetera? Maybe that's a question for the applicant. Sure. Yeah, I would be Sorry, go ahead. Adam, go for it if you had something no, to say. No, no, no. Feel free to go ahead. I think you guys have a, a detailed list of the improvements you're making in terms of sustainability elements to the building. Sure, we do. And I'm going to let my client chime in after this because he's more familiar with what they've committed to inside the building. But from a heating and cooling perspective, remember, you have new windows. The roof was recently upgraded. Things like that are going to lead to better energy usage. Um, Chris, did you want to speak specifically to the boiler or whatever is uh, providing heating and cooling, your HVAC system? Sure. Hi, this is Chris Milkey with the applicant. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so we have um, high efficiency boilers in the building. It's a central centralized water source system. Um, when we renovate the building, we will replace every unit in every, every local package unit in, in each unit. Uh, I know I said unit a lot of times. Um, but effectively, every unit will have a new HVAC system. It is sourced and fed by a central system, which is high efficiency using high efficiency boilers. Oh, great! But but you had never you had never um, worked through um, any agenda with the green building staff. That's correct. For an adaptive reuse, that would not occur. Um, I can speak to that, Nick, here again. We did sit down with green building staff and with planning staff, and that is what led to the series of commitments that are in site plan condition number 19. And those are the green building commitments that we're doing with this renovation. What they had us do was essentially look at it and say, all right, um, this is not a new building. You're not redeveloping the site, so you would not do some sort of LEED certification or something like that. But what are you doing? What can you commit to? And um, under what measurable standards can you commit to these elements? And so we had Energy Star appliances, water sense fixtures, EV charging stations, lighting power reduction, and energy efficient windows. And those are all um, things that we've committed to with measurable standards for following through. Great. Thank you, Thank you very much. Commissioner Schroll, um, you, did you have your hand up? Can I ask if you are not part of the discussion right now to please turn off your camera? We would like our cameras on when we're speaking so we can see each other, but it seems to be interfering with our connection. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Guerin. Um, I answered one of my own questions, uh, so that's good. Um, but I would like to follow up um, with Mr. Cummings. Um, how many EV um, parking spaces? Uh, can you speak to the electric vehicle infrastructure you're planning to install? So once you get into infrastructure, you're probably moving beyond me, but it was 2%. And I'm going to pull up site plan condition 19. And then uh, maybe Jeff can do some quick mental math on how many spaces 2% is out of the total provided parking spaces. Okay, so that's you're providing EVSE for the 2%. Um, looks like it's on um, kind of subcondition three here on page 34 of the staff report from my colleagues. Um, so will you be um, installing the uh, electrical capacity in the building to expand to add additional EVSD in the future? So I'm going to, I'll turn my camera back on. Um, I will defer to uh, my client Chris, on um, what the capacity is going to be as they do the renovation of this interior garage. Just to remind you that, of course, it's a renovation, and so there is obviously a limit to what can be done here, and there's a limit to what the existing transformer is going to handle, those sorts of challenges. And with that uh, planned delay, Chris, do you want to chime in? Sure. Thank you. Um, it's a good question. We, we haven't worked out every detail on the EV quantity because um, it's kind of market-driven, and since we plan on being condos, um, similar to when we built the townhomes next door, 
um, it was kind of a discussion with a buyer of what do you need and um, is it something that you're going to have and are you buying a parking space? So it's kind of a market driven thing. Um, we, we will do the required amount of the 2% that Mr. Cummings uh, mentioned. Um, and to the extent we have capacity, we will expand um, on a market uh, based uh, front. Um, we are we have not gone through um, the utility consultants to talk about expanding transformers, which is one of the conditions uh, in the, in the uh, plan. So with that said, I know it doesn't really answer your question, but it's market driven, I guess is the short answer. Sure, um, I appreciate that. And um, so it sounds like it's about three spaces. Um, I mean, I certainly understand it's a market driven thing. Um, and maybe from your perspective, the market isn't there now. Um, I would encourage you all though, um, to think about at least trying to get the electrical capacity in the building um, to the extent possible. Um, electric vehicles are gonna be cost at uh, cost parity with internal combustion engine vehicles within the next five years. And so um, just kind of to, to put that out there. Um, and renovating later, I know you're doing a renovation now, and so what I'm gonna say may not be exactly applicable since it's an exist, existing building, um, but going back to rehab um, and add it later is significantly more expensive. And so um, rehabs can be kind of up to six times as expensive. Um, so perhaps it's not gonna be the same for you all, maybe it's only you know three times more expensive given it's an existing infrastructure uh, there, but um, would encourage you to look at that um, to make this, um, you know, a more helpful project for our, our energy goals going forward. Um, so with that, Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you, Commissioner Schwal. Um, let's move on to the next item that Commissioner Morton identified for us, since some of these seem to be overlapping her first query about adaptive use, use conversion. The second point she raised was, is the quality of the proposed streetscape and the associated project improvements in sufficient alignment with the RB corridor streetscape standards? Any comments on this? Or Commissioner Morton, did you want to speak to what you were especially concerned about? Hi, um, I just wanted to note, it was a deviation that's been noted by staff. It is minor, um, nonetheless, you know, like I said, this isn't an, an environment that we really welcome today. And the applicant has actually done quite a few things to try to um, green up the parking lot. Um, they, uh, they didn't stress this so much in the presentation, but there were really considerable technical challenges that prevented them from meeting the letter of the streetscape standards. But I was curious as to whether people had an, an opinion about whether that was important or not. Thank you, Commissioner Morton. Commissioner Scholl, you have your hand up. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I would like to hear from the applicant um, and have them walk through the limitations. Um, as I understand them, there's some great challenges, um, a V dot retaining wall, but I would like you to kind of walk around the entire site because it seems like the applicant is not proposing to um, modify any of the existing um, streetscape with, with respect to clear widths and side, sidewalks. I understand this is a, uh, redevelopment, but would love to have you do um, walk through that. And then I have another question about um, curb cuts, if I might add, ask that here. Sure, thank you. Mr. I'm gonna, yes, I'm gonna call on Mr. Kreps uh, to respond to that. And I think you correctly, while he unmutes himself, correctly cited some of the challenges, the others would be the significant number of utilities around the site. Jeff, let us know if there's a slide you would like as well. Well, I think we can, just by walking around, I think everyone's familiar enough with the site to understand when VDOT came through, we'll start on Courthouse Road. So when VDOT came through and rebuilt the ramp, they constructed a low retaining wall along the sidewalk frontage that also, uh, it's within about six inches of what the RB Corridor streetscape standards would require. However, they've got a big utility running underneath the curb that prevents us moving street trees out there and it would, you know, it would narrow the sidewalk even more. So in trying to keep the most generous sidewalk 
available along Courthouse Road, we all collectively felt that it made the most sense because it seems to be fairly well trafficked to leave it as wide as possible. Now, that being said, we are proposing the plants, the trees in spirit are being planted sort of on top of that wall, if you will. So the wall runs, you know, if you've been down there anywhere from, you know, a foot up to about four feet in, in height, maybe at the most. So behind it is that berm, and then on top of that berm would be the trees that we're proposing. So again, as was shown in the earlier slide too, you know, at maturity, they will provide certainly some shade and respite for those walking along that edge, uh, and also provide a bit of a screen for the parking. So I think it's uh, it accomplishes what the the goal is, which is to you know reduce reduce some of the heating and make that that. Uh, that area more more sort of bring it down to scale, if you will. So you'll have some, you know, an overhead tree um, above you forming that sort of nice passageway. Um, so with Courthouse Road, that's what we felt was the most appropriate way to to do that. You know, there are provisions uh, in the county uh, oftentimes to allow street trees to be planted, you know, in board of the sidewalk. Um, it's not. It's sort of atypical in the Roslyn Boston corridor standards, but it's not an. It's not a. It's not completely without precedent within the county. So again, I think this meets the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish there. So that kind of addresses Courthouse Road. As if you imagine yourself walking north on Courthouse, headed up the hill, uh, and you were to take a right onto 13th Street, that first corner um, is. One is very, very steep, so there's there's a lot going on there. And two, there are multiple utilities that are going diagonally across that site. You can see in the upper right hand corner of the screen, there are several utilities that run through there that are are significant enough that there are two things going on. The, because of the grade, in order for us to rebuild the sidewalk, we would have to push that sidewalk toward the building, of course. The grade is falling away from us. We would have to build walls to hold the sidewalk up, but the walls can't, you can't build a wall across the easement. So we're really severely constrained. You can see that orange and green line that runs sort of across the top and then diagonally down. All of that infrastructure prevents us from really doing any kind of uh, work in, in those areas. So as a consequence, the existing the existing sidewalk, which is outboard of that, up against the curb. So as you turn the corner and you head up 13th, because of it's fair, it's a, sort of funny to say, but it's fairly flat from a grading standpoint, right where you cross that apron. But then you have this transition point where you've got now we have, as you saw from the existing condition slide, there's an existing sloping hill. It also has some utilities running through it, but not as restrictive. So we feel comfortable that we're able to get some street trees in once again in spirit to meet the requirements uh, or meet the, the intent, I guess, and the spirit of the corridor standards um, while sort of recognizing, acknowledging the limitations that we're working with. So again, the intent here is we're, you're, we will give street trees where we can, and we will, of course, provide a lot more planting in those corners, all that landscape area we were just talking about is the area we talked about removing the lawn and installing all the, uh, the 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 varied palette of plants, as Mr. Byrne uh, spoke to. So that sort of gets us around the two public uh, streets that are our frontage, as uh, Mr. Watson mentioned, 12th Court North, which is at the bottom of the page, uh, basically meets the standard, and we're not proposing any improvements down there. We're not going down that far. Um, and then lastly, uh, just briefly, the western edge where we're proposing to enhance the existing pathway right now it's you know you can sort of walk on the concrete slab adjacent to the building those will be private units in the future so there's a small screen wall that will be put right along the edge in this particular drawing it's shown as white that white edge is the the for private terrace, if you will. There would be a low sort of screen wall right there. And then the, this, this boardwalk feature that we're talking about would be built outboard of that. Again, there's a lot of existing trees on that hillside that slopes to the you know page left. It goes up the hill. There's a lot of good canopy there, but we have the opportunity to present uh, and provide a lot more flowering understory type trees, which would be you know very common for this area. And so we think that will help uh, dramatically 
uh, increase not only the, the sort of aesthetics of the site and make it a pleasant walk for those people on the boardwalk, but it'll also be a visual amenity for the folks who are living in this building. So, Mr. Scholl, I hope that addressed what you were what you were after. Um, Mr. Krebs, thank you for kind of walking through that. Um, I appreciate the detail with which you did that um, and for us to understand the limitations on the site. Um, I just... Commissioner Schultz, Mr. Watson had his hand up too. Do you want to see yeah. what he had to contribute? Mr. Watson? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. All I wanted to do was just allow to share that one exhibit on the screen, which hopefully you could see where the existing utilities are. And then I had another one showing the proposal and the rendering that the applicant had provided just, just for visual aid. I didn't have anything else to say. Thank you, though. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess the only point I'd make here is um, Understanding that this is um, a conversion, an existing building, we're not starting from scratch or here, so there are limits to what we can accomplish. Um, but that being said, the likelihood that a, that this building gets torn down in the future is probably pretty low once it becomes a condo building. And so, you know, this might be the opportunity for us to try to get additional clear width on these sidewalks um, for decades to come. And so understanding that there are limitations here, but also that there, just my colleagues, that there are certainly many benefits for rehabs, many environmental benefits, um, but there are certainly some significant trade-offs um, with respect to kind of streetscape and things like that. Um, um, Madam Chair, if I might just ask a, a, another kind of street-related question. Yes. Um, this is more for staff. Um, Ms. Kim or Mr. Watson, I'm wondering about staff's opinion on maintaining the existing curb cuts um, that are here. Um, you could speak to that. Sure. Sure, Commissioner Scholl. This is this is Adam Watson. I'll I will I can speak and then if, if, if Jane would like to, to chime in, I'll I'll let her as well defer to her on that. We we did ask that the um, the applicant consider reducing the number of curb cuts here. However, um, it is very challenging to do that. Um, again, walking sort of around the site, at the top of the site, you have or 13th Street North, the furthest to the north, you have a curb cut there to access what's going to be the loading area to remain and some parking up there as well. So th that curb cut needs to remain. What we were also looking at is down North Courthouse Road, you have two two curb cuts, one basically to enter into the site and one to enter in the garage a little bit higher up the hill. The issue is that the garage in this building, this building being so old, the garage is not internally connected. So the garage entrance off of the top one off of Courthouse Road provides access to that second level of parking and then the second curb cut provides access into the front parking lot and the portico share at the front door, et cetera, and also the garage that accesses the lower level of parking. And then lastly, the curb cut at the bottom provides access to 12th Court North. So even though we asked to see if there was a way that would be feasible for those to be reduced further, um, we do ultimately recognize that they are, unfortunately for this situation, you know, given that this building is here to remain and they're not changing that, those curb cuts all do provide essentially necessary functions. And so with that, I, I'll just defer to, to Ms. Kim if she has anything else she wants to add. Thank you. Ms. Kim? Um, I think um, Adam covered it pretty well. I mean, I think we'd love to see, again, some reduction or even the um, width of the driveway entrances to be reduced as much as possible. And I believe the applicant um, you know, has, has done their best to kind of make those entrances as um, visible to pedestrians as possible. Um, Jeff, perhaps if you want to chime in on, on that, you know, that may be helpful now. I, again, I think it's been covered pretty well because of the grade separation. I think, you know, we really do need those, uh, those entrances, the two off of courthouse in particular, um, the width in order to make the turning movements to uh, safely get in. Now, of course, this, the parking lot is two-way circulation. Uh, <laughs> loop 
So in order to accommodate those movements, um, we felt that, you know, leaving the existing driveways in their current configuration was uh, the safest and the best way to go. Uh, the top one on 13th Street North, it serves not only loading, but also trash removal back there. And we've been up on site when that maneuver is taking place and they need, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, you know, every bit of that particular curb cut. So it is a, a reality that we tried, you know, quite seriously to consider, uh, but ultimately, uh, just felt that the, the existing condition was was the best way to go in, in this particular time. Okay, um, that's helpful and I appreciate that explanation. Um, all right, I, I'll yield back. Thank you. Commissioner Peterson, you've been waiting. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was interested to know a little bit more about the bike access for the streetscape um, on page 15 of the staff report. It's talking about um, the bike connectivity and uh, North Courthouse Road um, is listed as a bike lane street. And I just wanted to double check. I don't remember there being a bike lane. So I didn't know if um, if there is not one, if there's going to be one. Um, I know there's a bike lane um, up higher on um, Courthouse Road and there's also a trail um, very close to where this project is. So I just wanted to make sure we've thought through the connectivity um, and thought about, um, you know, people tend to drive a little bit fast on North Court Hat Road when they're merging to get onto 50. Um, and so are people gonna be bike biking on the sidewalks there? Um, and have we thought about that connectivity? Thank you. Thank you. Who'd like to address that? Hi, it's uh, Jane Kim from DES. Thanks, Ms. Kim. Um, so this, th there are no um, street marking changes proposed with this development, um, as it is, you know, all within their their parcel, um, and the curb lines and the like aren't um, being impacted. Um, I don't believe there's a marked bike lane on North Courthouse. I've ridden this section of North Courthouse and don't recall there being one. Um, but I have ridden on the sidewalk, for instance, to get to the, I think I, the trail that um, runs along Route 50 that you're speaking of. So there is that connectivity there. At this time, there's nothing, I, don't, I believe, marked. And I think it's hard with the way that the ramp kind of eats into North Courthouse in front of the property frontage. Um, and, you know, we're not really expecting this particular development to add that um, infrastructure. So, you know, hopefully that answers your question. We do recognize that this is, you know, a path that people do take um, to get to the Route 50 path. And so that, that exists. and. Again, you know, there is a little bit of a hill there, and so I'm not sure how popular of a route it is. I think it's generally preferable to go through the neighborhood or Barton a little bit further down to get to the, some of those destinations. Um, but for this project and the site plan, we are not uh, changing any of the street markings that are um, what's out there today. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the next item on Commissioner Morton's list of items to consider. And if we need to, we can come back to some of the others. But she'd also raise the issues about site design, the function and design of the pedestrian pathway, whether or not the private easement would be sufficient to ensure access by the public, and elaboration of accessibility issues. I, for one, would like to know if the path is accessible to someone with a mobility impairment. If you're, this is Jeff Kreps from Vica. If you're talking about the western path along the the edge of the building, the sort of the enhanced boardwalk that we're proposing. Yes. Yeah, that particular trail is not uh, accessible now, nor could it be in the future. There is a large uh, set of stairs on the southern side of that uh, of the building that the sidewalk. Uh, dead ends into, and there are a number of utility easements that run through there once again. We And we also, we studied it. We don't have the physical space 
to the grade change is such is so significant that we don't have the physical space to actually get a ramp up there, even if we could. Um, so we were constrained both in terms of uh, just space as well as easements. Uh, so that uh, it's again, it's not accessible now, nor is it uh, practical. Uh, I think it meets that site and practical in practicality test, excuse me, uh, to make that that western edge accessible. Um, of course, Courthouse Road is not accessible, and portions of 13th Street might be uh, closer to the corner. But as you go page, you know, to the left and up the hill, uh, once again, it is it is not accessible. That the streetscape is not accessible that way either. So, that's my sort of my uh, my my talk about accessibility. Okay, thank you. Um, what about this issue with the private easement agreement? Could staff give us a sense of whether or not they think that's going to be sufficient for long-term public access? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, yeah, regarding the easement, right, correct. So just to back up for a second, so this path has existed for 40 to 50 years. There's no easement there that exists today. What the applicant is proposing to do is not only to widen it, but then provide a private access easement agreement with the two neighboring properties to the south. We do we do feel that this easement is going to cover the customary users of this path. Um, if you if you let's see if I could let me see if I can pull here back this presentation and I'm going to go hopefully to the top map and hopefully you'll be able to see this please let me know if you can see the map yes okay so so the the properties that this easement would include include all i don't know perhaps you can't see my cursor but that on the south side of the site it's the condominiums basically to the southeast and then the, the apartments directly south if you're going to be traversing this site to get to the metro station from here, we do feel that, that those are going to be probably 90, 95% of the users here. And we also think that it's it's not going to, we believe that the applicant's going to be acting in good faith not to prohibit others from using it. So we do feel that a private easement is going to, is going to cover this. In addition, as Mr. Krebs just covered, this is not a ADA accessible route, nor could it be given the site constraints. So if you're going to be looking for an accessible route, you're going to be taking a different path anyway. So those are the two, so those are two, I would say, key functional reasons for why we, we're, we're fine with it. I would say adding on to that, traditionally, um, when you get a, a public easement for something like this, there is usually a density credit exchange. In this case, the density is decreasing, so they're not seeking to earn additional density with this site. Or you have a scenario where you have specific policy guidance calling for public access through a certain route, which is, again, not the case here where this this pathway is overall a great improvement, but is not something that is specifically called for in any of our adopted plans or policies. So those are the key reasons why we think this private easement is sufficient. That being said, we have uh, written the condition which the applicant does agree to, which would require that they grant and record this easement to those neighbors and record those in the land records. They have to provide evidence of that to the zoning administrator before they could get a certificate of occupancy uh, for tenant occupancy on the final floor of the building. So, um, and, and they have agreed to that. So for all those reasons, we think this will functionally uh, serve as many users as it does today, and will ensure that the path uh, remains open in the future as well. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Watson. Commissioner Morton. Thank you. Um, I So thank you to the applicant. This was, um, arranged uh, at the, you know, at the 11th hour, I think. And I would really love to hear a bit more about your plans for um, who's allowed on the path, how are you going to enforce it, uh, recognizing this isn't called out specifically in the courthouse plan. Nonetheless, there are these uh, strong principles conveyed about trying to connect residential to the courthouse. Uh, the language of 24 hours a day was also in there, which I didn't include in my report. So I'm wondering, how did you um, come to the conclusion that this would serve most customary users? And I just love to hear a little bit more about um, uh, the interface with the units. Uh, will there be signage uh, 
suggesting uh, that only certain people are allowed to use it, uh, et cetera. So I'll start the team off. Um, the easement is going to be for the benefit of our residents and their guests and the residents and their guests of those uh, developments that Adam identified that are just to the plan south here, um, allowing them to use the pathway, uh, you know, really virtually at all times. Um, I think that in reality, and, um, you know, I'll let uh, Chris weigh in on this if he so chose, uh, it, the pathway is going to be open and um, anyone that's walking through there, it's not like we're going to be, um, you know, posting a security guard who's going to check and see if somebody's a guest of each one of the residences at the bottom or the top of the hill, right? What this does is gives us the ability to manage it um, and keep it safe. Uh, that was part of the concern that when you give a public access easement for this space behind the building that, you know, we'd be in a position where we'd have to call the police if there was any issue back there. And then their position typically would be, well, it's a public uh, space and anyone's allowed to be there, you know, almost really at any hour of the day and as long as they want. Um, it's not a particularly visible pathway and we do want to keep it uh, something that's very appealing and safe for the residents who are really going to be using this to commute going up and down to the, to, to the metro and which could easily be again in the evening um, and at dark. When we get into design elements, I'll, uh, I think I'll defer to Jeff and then we'll um, you know let Chris weigh in if you'd like. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Commissioner Morton, did you have more questions? No, are you going to show design, um, Mr. Cummings? Yeah, I, I was inviting Jeff to speak. I apologize okay. for not being clear enough, but um, Jeff, I think you could speak more to uh, the design of the pathway that Wade interfaces with the units, um, and then we can state whether or not we see any, so just so that you have the background signage or something like that, it would be something that would come either at the time of final landscape plan or be something that we wouldn't even be depicting on a on a building plan. So I'll let Chris speak to whether he thinks he would add any. Adam, I don't know if you are available, if you can pull up our, yeah, there you go, that's perfect. So from a design standpoint, as I sort of outlined earlier, the, 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 you can see the steps that exist now, they come up right to the right of that, that area is what will be, uh, it's currently, you would walk on that sidewalk to get to the, what's well, just basically a concrete slab to get to the to 13th street, that now becomes the private terrace so there's a, would be a low screen wall between the terrace and this and this walkway, which would be we're of course exploring ways to light that uh, downward facing path lights, that kind of thing to marker lighting to allow you to something that wouldn't be uh, offensive to the residents, but would provide a safe uh, and very clear way to get through at, at all hours of the day. But then. Uh, the rest of it is simply just uh, you know, a formalized boardwalk. There is an existing storm drain, uh, that gravel that's, that's sort of below where the people are standing there. That's a, a feature that needs to remain in place, so we're effectively bridging over it. Um, but that, again, you know, enhanced planting, but then to provide a very, you know, uh, a separation between the, the people using the pathway as well and from the residents so that they have some measure of, of security and privacy along that particular edge. Thank you, appreciate it. And hi, this is uh, Chris Milky. I'll speak to the paths and keeping them open. Our intent is to keep them open as they are now. As um, Jeff Kreps uh, indicated, the path will be pushed away from the building to allow for these private uh, uh, path, uh, I'm sorry, porches. Um, and it will be it will be lit for security, both for our, our residents on their porches as well as anybody who wants to walk through. Um, the way we see the paths is there's three paths for anybody kind of in the vicinity of the Bell at Vista and the townhomes that are adjacent to it, because they're really bordered or bounded up to the south by Route 50. So you're really picking up people in that in that cluster and the people on the other side of Fairfax from Bell at Vista. So there are three paths. One of them is at the, what direction is that? West end of 12th Court North where it hits Fairfax, there is a set of steps that we proffered up when we built the condominiums, which are now Bella Vista. So there's a set of steps on the west end. There's the subject uh, pathway that we're speaking of, uh, neither of which of those two are ADA because of significant steps on both of them. Um, and then as Mr. Watson uh, adequately pointed out, the ADA path, if you will, would be up, uh, 
to come across 12th Court North and go up the North Courthouse, North Courthouse pathway. So the way we see it is there's three paths for effectively three communities, um, two of which are associated with uh, Vista. And I don't recall the name of the uh, small condominium complex on the other side of Fairfax from Bella Vista, but we've seen it through the years of ownership that it's not terribly well traveled, but it is consistently and regularly used. And we believe that that's, uh, those three paths will, will serve the community as well. Thank you. Commissioner Morton, did you have yeah, more than that? Yeah, just super quickly in the interest of time. So you're, I understand you don't know the exact nature of the sign. Is there a, a gate anticipated? I'm sorry, a gate along the pathway? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the next couple of items that were identified for discussion. More on transportation. Commissioner Schroll, did you have more on that? You did ask some parking questions early on. And any other commissioners? Uh, no, Madam Chair. Thank you. Then let's um, let's go on to the elaboration of the sustainability features. And if anyone has other items, let's raise those then as well. I have some questions about this. I appreciated Mr. Burns' comments about biophilia, and um, it is the idea of connecting people with nature so that they can get those regular benefits from access to nature. So I would expand upon the point that he made and encourage you to plant natives because they do change with the seasons and give people some sort of temporal connection and that's an interesting way to connect with nature. I know our urban forestry staff can help you find native trees and shrubs and even ground covers. Um, in general, though, I'm happy to see those site plan improvements and some general commitment to sustainability and other county policies. And I see some of my colleagues have their hands up. Commissioner Morton, did you want to speak to this issue? And then Commissioner Peterson. Um, no, I, I, I think I've said what I need to say about that. I was curious because it hasn't been explored in much detail if my colleagues had anything uh, to ask. Thank you. Your hand icon was still up. I'm sorry, guys. That's my only way of gauging whether or not you have something to say. So be cognizant of those. Commissioner Peterson. Uh, thank you very much. I also um, wanted to echo um, Mr. Burns's comments about biophilic elements. I just wanted to ask the applicant how they will go about choosing what um, plants go into that space, uh, what experts they may consult. Um, Commission, uh, Chair Gearin mentioned, you know, contacting the urban forestry. Um, so do you plan on planting the native species? Are you planting eggplants? Are you planting um, other um, uh, local, um, local greenery? Thank you so much. Thank you. This is Jeff Kreps again. So we absolutely are committed to a native plant palette uh, throughout uh, the, the entire site, not just on the areas where we're removing the lawn. So we've done a, you know, a number of projects in the area. We're quite uh, familiar with which of the native plants will do well in an urban environment. And the, certainly the, the, all your comments are very well, well taken. The goal would be to provide year-round interest via a mix of both evergreen and flowering shrubs. Uh, so you know, during the winter doesn't look too bleak. Certainly pollinators, as Mr. Byrne mentioned, uh, to attract as many of the different kinds of urban insect wildlife as we can, um, and to just generally enhance the whole edge uh, to, the, to the extent that we're able, but absolutely committed to a native plant palette. Uh, a number of them will do quite well, uh, and we think that we can accomplish the county's goals um, related to biophilia through that strategy. Thank you. Anyone else with any comments in general on this proposal? Okay, not seeing any. I believe we're ready for a motion. Commissioner Morton? Okay, so. Sorry, I don't have this up here. It's okay. So, um, I move the Planning Commission recommend the County Board adopt the attached Site Plan Amendment Ordinance, SC76, to allow the conversion of 187 hotel units to 180 residential dwelling units 
located at 1200 North Courthouse Road with modifications of zoning ordinance requirements, including reduced parking, increased compact parking percentage, and increased lot coverage, subject to the conditions of the ordinance. All I'll second. All second. Okay, I saw Commissioner, who, who said that first? It looked like Commissioner Hughes was ready to. Who spoke? Uh, I did. Commissioner Lantelme. Commissioner Lantelme, thank you. Motion by Commissioner Moore and seconded by Commissioner Lantelme. Any discussion on the motion? Commissioner Scholl? And then Commissioner Hughes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do intend to support the motion uh, by Commissioner Morton. Um, on balance, yes, this is, as um, others have noted, I think the Transportation Commission noted, better than what's there today. Um, saying that it does come with some um, significant compromises. Um, and so I vote for it knowing that, you know, from an environmental standpoint, there are some benefits of not building a new building and retaining that building. Um, but we, as we heard tonight, there are also limitations about how efficient the building can be, what we can do from urban design standpoint, um, and also, unfortunately, knowing that this building will likely be there for the foreseeable future with some of these limitations from a site access standpoint um, as well. Um, so I did hear from my colleagues that, uh, a desire to maybe discuss this more fully in an LRPC. It's something I can take back um, to our staff um, liaisons and get back to you all on that front. Um, so I did hear you um, and we can hopefully continue this conversation um, outside the scope of, of this um, project. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Schroll. I align my comments with yours. This is better than what is there. Um, we would always like to see more. Um, Commissioner Hughes and then Commissioner Morton. Commissioner Green, I, I want to further amplify, I think, Commissioner Schroll's point. Um, my support this evening is uh, primarily on the basis that the original building, as staff clearly laid out, was a by right development of residential units. Um, I'm glad to see LRPC in the future has the office conversion uh, question for us to consider. The, the, the benefits we receive from this redevelopment are uh, severely lacking compared to what we would receive from a new development, for example, our affordable housing contribution, just to name a few. So while my support on this one is tonight uh, conditioned, I do think going forward, we need to think deeply about how the uh, provision of public services come to us through the redevelopment process and what we receive and what we don't receive with such conversions. So this evening's uh, proposal I do support because it was a by right residential building converted in the 80s to a hotel and then we convert it back today. Um, but moving forward, I do think it's an item for further discussion. So, Commissioner Schull, I look forward to that at the LRPC meetings. Thank you, Commissioner Gary. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Commissioner Morton. Thank you. I'll align myself with Commissioner Schroll and uh, Commissioner Hughes. Um, I work and teach in the historic preservation field, and although I don't think this is a historic building and probably never will be, it's made me very sensitive to the fact that it is very hard to adapt um, buildings for a new use um, to today's standards. Um, and it's, it's interesting to note that most adaptive use now, um, the overwhelming majority are for housing. And in fact, many of them, I think two thirds of those are for moderate and low income housing. So it's really worth thinking. Um, I, I appreciate Commiss Commissioner Scholl saying um, you'll be thinking about it um, at LRPC at some point. Um, but having said that, my own support of this project is very strongly uh, influenced by the two conditions that staff were able to insert, uh, number 57 and 58, about the path and the pavers. So recognizing um, you still need to be vigilant about trying to maintain the spirit of whatever guiding uh, plans there are. So had it not been for those conditions, I wouldn't be supporting the project. So thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Morton. I'm looking to see if my colleagues have any final comments. And without seeing any, I believe we're ready for a vote. I'll go in the same order as last time. Commissioner Lantelmi? Aye. Commissioner Bagley? Aye. Commissioner Hughes? Aye. Commissioner Morton? Aye. Commissioner Patel? 
Aye. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sarley? Aye. Commissioner Schroll? Aye. Commissioner Siegel? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Steinberger? Aye. Commissioner Weir? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Guerin, aye. The motion passes unanimously, 12, uh, all 12 of us. I do want to thank uh, the applicant, staff, Mr. Watson and Ms. Kim, and uh, Commissioners Morton and Siegel. You did an excellent job with the report. We are happy to see the changes made to the site, and I am heartened to hear that our LRPC chair will take forward our, uh, our concerns with the greater issue of um, adapting for conversion and reuse. Thank you very much. With that, Madam Clerk, would you please call the next item? Item number three, amendment to the Arlington County Zoning Ordinance, Article 11.2. This will be presented by Matt Matuzic, Akira Brown, and Melissa Danowski. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Matuzic, Ms. Brown, and Ms. Danowski. Thank you, and good evening. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. All right. Uh, my name is Matt Matuzek, and I'm with the Arlington County Planning Division. Uh, I'm going to start tonight's presentation with uh, some general context uh, before handing it over to our housing staff to describe the proposed amendment in greater detail. Next slide. The amendment we'll be presenting this evening was initially heard by the county board in June. At that time, as you recall, staff was asked to conduct some additional public outreach over the summer, while the cash contribution amendment went forward and was approved in July. Uh, so since that time, these two items were separated. Um, we also wanted to use this opportunity to clarify that this is a specific amendment to the neighborhood's form-based code zoning tool, which only applies to the certain areas of Columbia Pike Corridor, which we'll see later in the slide deck. This particular amendment which began to, to be worked on by staff several years ago, is also separate from the missing middle housing study, which is proceeding on a separate schedule and covers the entire county. Next slide. As you can see, staff's outreach was quite extensive um, and extended be well beyond the typical groups involved in any uh, typical amendments to the form-based code. Uh, many of these meetings, uh, particularly this summer, uh, were intentionally structured so that staff could hear from individual stakeholders or small groups to ensure adequate opportunities for quality feedback and discussion. Uh, our remaining public engagements will occur later this week with the Housing Commission and County Board later this month. Next slide. Now, given the nature of the proposed amendment, uh, it's important to first revisit some of the earlier planning efforts that took place along Columbia Pike and which led to the creation of the neighborhood's form based code. Anytime staff considers potential changes to the zoning tool, as has been the case in the past, we've always returned to the initial purpose and intent behind why this tool was developed in the first place. Um, and while I believe this may be very helpful for those viewing this for the first time, uh, others who I think have been following this very closely can probably recite it as well as I have. Uh, next slide. So starting in 2008, uh, the county initiated the second phase of the Columbia Pike Initiative. Um, the purpose of this effort was to study the multifamily residential areas located in between the commercial nodes that were previously studied as part of phase one. And that occurred during the late 1990s and early 2000s. Unlike the commercial nodes, whose main purpose was to incentivize mixed use redevelopment and where commercial uses were required, phase two focused on preserving and creating housing that would be affordable to a broad range of incomes. This was particularly important as the county was already experiencing a significant loss of affordability resulting from market pressures on existing residential properties. The neighborhood's farm based code was structured to strategically influence future decisions by property owners to consider higher densities as other improvements would occur through redevelopment, including on-site affordability. The four-year planning effort was documented in the Columbia Pike Neighborhoods Area Plan and adopted by the County Board in 2012. Next slide. So similar to what occurred with phase one of this effort, um, where a form-based code zoning tool was created to help implement the vision for the commercial areas, staff, consultants in the community worked through most of 2013 to develop a second form-based code, which would serve a similar purpose, but within the multifamily residential areas of the corridor. 
So as of 2013, Columbia Pike has had two distinct form-based code zoning tools whose geographies are depicted on this slide. The amendment you'll be hearing tonight only applies to the neighborhood's form-based code, which is shown in the brighter red hatch on this exhibit and where those multifamily residential complexes exist today. Next slide. And with that, I will hand it over to Akiria to provide a greater detail on the proposed amendment. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, as Matt stated, um, my name is Akiria Brown and I work in the housing division. Um, and I'd like to talk about um, the affordable ownership program and some of the challenges that we're seeing. Next slide. So I'd like to first explain what a affordable ownership unit is. Um, an ownership property uh, that is made available to qualified moderate income households. These units are subject to restrictive covenants that essentially uh, require it to remain affordable for an unlimited period of time or into perpetuity. At resale, uh, the value of an affordable ownership unit will reflect the original purchase price plus annual increases in the HUD area median income um, limitations. This is in contrast to market rate units, which increase in value based on the market conditions. So a hypothetical example uh, would be if you purchased one of these units in 2020 uh, for 300,000, and there was a HUD AMI increase of 3% um, over the next year, um, that next year's uh, sales price could not exceed 309,000, which would be that increase. Um, and additionally, the property taxes for these units are based on the restricted value. It's important to note that owners are not required to leave or sell these units at any specific time. Uh, the above hypothetical is just an example. We typically see an increase in the income guidelines um, that are again published by HUD annually of about three and a half percent year over year. Uh, ownership unit owners have access to all community amenities um, and have the same appliances and fixtures uh, as well as um, all of the other amenities uh, associated with the community um, that are um, associated with the standard market rate units within the development. Um, and while the equity is restricted, um, it is this restriction that allows us to make these units affordable for future households. Next slide, please. So this is a table of the area median income uh, by household. So as you can see, a family of two earning 80% of the area median income uh, earns about $80,000 and a household of two earning 60% of the area median income would be earning about $58,000. Only the households currently um, in that red section are eligible for the neighborhood form-based code um, ownership units that are affordable up to 60% of AMI. Um, and it's noteworthy that 89% of our ownership unit portfolio is priced affordable to households at 80% of AMI. Um, next slide, please. This is a breakdown of our affordable ownership unit portfolio, um, just indicating what those uh, property types are. Um, and again, underscoring that 89% of our existing portfolio is affordable up to 80% of AMI. Next slide. So the highlights of this program, and again, this is an overview of the program. Uh, these units have a restriction value or a restriction period, um, and that essentially has the unit to be um, restricted in the value um, into perpetuity. 
Uh, the next element is that, um, again, the appreciation of these units um, is based or aligns with the HUD area median income limits. Um, and then lastly, the uh, restrictive covenants uh, state that the, the, the owners must use these units as uh, their primary residence uh, and the units have resale restrictions. So the county uses a deed covenant to secure the sale and resale of uh, the controlled price, uh, basically, uh, basically ensuring that the um, initial sales price and the uh, future resale prices um, are in line with the tenants of uh, our program policy. Uh, the initial price is calculated using a formula that uh, ensures that households at 60 and 80 percent of uh, the area median income would be paying 33 percent of their income towards the monthly mortgage. Subsequent sales or resales are based upon the increases in value over the time period that it was initially purchased and uh, the time period that it is sold. Next slide. So the county um, conducts a random selection drawing when um, any of these units become available. We maintain a notification list of pre-approved purchasers. Again, these households must meet income and household, household size criteria. And they also have to obtain a mortgage through a traditional lender for the full price of uh, the, the purchase. Uh, participants who live and or work in Arlington uh, receive preference for these units. And uh, additionally, staff is recommending that um, additional an additional drawing entry be um, provided to households that are along the Columbia Pike corridor. Um, at resale, these units are not owned by the county. It's very important to know that they are owned specifically by the purchasers. The deed is um, is transferred specifically um, between the purchasers. Um, and at resale, once again, the unit price is affordable at those certain income levels between 60 and 80 percent of AMI. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Uh, so why is this change necessary? Next slide. Um, staff is following the adopted uh, policy guidance, essentially. Um, the Columbia Pike Neighborhood Area Plan that was adopted in 2012 indicates that we should support retention of existing and the creation of new ownership units that are affordable between 60 and 120 percent of AMI. Additionally, the master plan adopted in 2015 after the neighborhood form-based code zoning tool um, had a goal to incentivize the production of moderately priced ownership units uh, through land use and zoning policy. And it specifically recommends encouraging the production of ownership units between 80 and 120 percent of AMI. So staff uh, believes that increasing the AMI limits for uh, the neighborhood form-based code ownership units is one tool that can help to encourage uh, the production of these units as stipulated in the adopted policy. Next slide. So one of the questions that we hear often is, well, what are other um, areas doing? What are other regions and, and cities doing? Um, so this map shows the maximum area median income limits for ownership programs uh, throughout the region. In Arlington, all units in the county's affordable ownership program are affordable up to 80% of AMI, aside from the six affordable units in um, the neighborhood form-based code um, project or Carver Homes. 
the maximum income cap for any neighborhood jurisdiction, any nearby jurisdiction, is at least 70 to 80 percent of AMI, um, with no nearby jurisdictions capping the maximum at up to 60 percent of AMI. However, it is important to note that both uh, Montgomery County and Fairfax County um, have a tiered approach. Uh, among their ownership programs where um, they have a portion of their ownership units affordable up to 70 percent and another portion that is capped at 120 percent of AMI. Uh, Fairfax is currently taking a look at their 120 percent AMI levels for rental units only. Um, there are no changes planned for the ownership units at 120. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is an example of a household at 60% of AMI. Um, this is a household of two. They would have an um, annual earnings of $60,000 or 5,000 um, gross and 4,000 net respectively. Um, the affordable payment approximately for this household would be about $1,600, uh, leaving that household a net of about uh, $2,400 for their remaining expenses. And so that would be a savings and a debt, any debt associated with um, what, they, what they currently have or what they anticipate having, um, and additionally, uh, maintenance associated with uh, the unit. We're, we're looking at possibly a, an affordable um, ownership price of about 300000 and that's assuming that this household does not have a lot of debt. Um, and so without wage increases over time, an HOA fee rise could really pose um, significant challenges to uh, this household. Um, it's also important that, um, that I note that lenders use gross income to determine qualifications, but in practical terms, a household's uh, net income is really what impacts their day-to-day -day lives the most. Um, so staff is currently uh, seeing that at this income level, um, households really are exhibiting a problem um, to keeping pace and, and maintaining their ownership units. Uh, so knowing the importance of the long-term viability of these units, uh, we are concerned that at 60% of AMI, uh, these households are without the means to manage uh, without significant income increases. Next slide. So with that example in mind, here is an actual depiction of our only 60% of AMI development. Um, and this is the Carver Homes development. In 26, 2017, uh, six ownership units were approved as part of the Carver Homes development. Um, these uh, three bedroom units were priced affordable up to 60% of AMI uh, for households of four. The initial price was about $280,000. Um, although there were about 56 income and household size eligible households in the county's um, notification list or uh, in the county's pool of interested buyers, only seven of those households were actually able to qualify for a mortgage. Um, all six of the buyers had little to no debt at the time of purchase, which is atypical of buyers um, of any moderate income range at this point. Um, and uh, for a household of four, 60% uh, of the area median income is about uh, $72,000. Next slide, please. So a few of the elements which considerably impact households at 60% of AMI um, really involve lending constraints. Uh, so federal rules have um, really created a um, really created housing market barriers to borrowers of modest means. Uh, credit score requirements have risen, uh, as well as proof of reserves. Um, which are typically between two and four months of a mortgage. 
And and lastly, um, and something that we don't really uh, think about, but um, employment. For a lot of these households at 60 percent of AMI, they may have a second job. But in order to qualify for a traditional mortgage and um, a, a mortgage that, that we know would be a, an approved lender, um, income from that second job is generally not allowed unless it has been derived from the same source for 12 months or within um, the exact same field for 20 months, 24 months without a 30-day um, interruption. And I know that that really sounds uh, complicated, and unfortunately, it is for a lot of people um, just trying to get around the stringent um, criteria in order to qualify for a mortgage. Next slide. So the existing regulations really prohibit households that earn just 61% of AMI from qualifying from these ownership units. Um, this practice of having a 60% AMI uh, limit is inconsistent with the adopted policy um, that directs us to um, provide um, ownership units um, above 60% in of AMI in various forms. Um, existing regulations also result in uh, limitations to the pool of ed eligible applicants, as uh, previously seen in my Carver Homes example. And lastly, the Neighborhood Form Based Code currently uh, fails to address the difficulty of households earning up to 60% of AMI um, with their ability to keep pace. Um, so knowing the level of unpredictability within the current real estate landscape, as well as the federal rules um, that have really created significant barriers for borrowers of moderate means. And also noting that initial prices of these units takes into account condominium fees. However, future fee increases are determined by the HOA. Um, so this um, poses a noteworthy threat to the financial stability of households at 60 percent of AMI if uh, their income does not uh, increase. Next slide. So with that said, uh, the proposal considers that if we maintain existing income limits, we will exclude many households uh, that would otherwise be priced out of the area's um, ownership market as well. Um, and this is a slide that just kind of represents what those households are made up of. Um, these are your teacher's assistants and um, child counselors and dental hygienists. Um, we also are looking at the um, inability of some of our um, emergency personnel to keep pace with the costs uh, associated with home ownership. Um, and businesses and public service employers, such as fire, police, um, schools, and hospitals, rely on employees of all income levels. Um, and so as housing costs continue to rise, uh, essential workers are being forced out as well. Next slide. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Melissa Danowski, to discuss recent development trends and challenges. Thank you. And I'm Melissa Danowski with the Housing Division. And uh, if you could go to the next slide. So with respect to actual development, the Commercial and Neighborhoods Form Based Code has produced almost 20 projects since it became available on Columbia Pike. While delivering over 3,400 total units, only 150 of them, or 4%, were condominiums, comprised of two developments at Trafalgar Flats and Carver Place. Furthermore, in terms of neighborhood form-based code project history from 2013 to 2020, there have been a total of four developments approved that contain 417 affordable units, and only 1% of those units were affordable ownership units, those units at Carver Place. If you could go to the next slide. And this trend of limited condo development is not just on Columbia Pike, countywide, where in many instances on-site affordability is not required. The last decade of development primarily delivered rental units. 91% um, of net new units were rental. 
um, and only 3% of approved projects represented net new condominiums. Uh, next slide. And as part of our research, we talked to various market rate and affordable developers, and they mentioned that generally condo development is riskier and can be more expensive than rental development. And as a result, condo projects are built less frequently and tend not to exceed 150 units. This is supported by historical development trends. All condo buildings constructed in the past 10 years contain less than 150 units. I do want to note that it's an approximate number and re reflects new construction. Um, many of the form based code sites, uh, especially on the eastern end, may have the potential for much more than 150 units and therefore might lend themselves to rental development. Next slide. The neighborhood form based code requires 20% to 35% of net new units be affordable based on the individual redevelopment scenario. And for some sites, this can mean that almost 30% of their total units would need to be affordable. And this can be economically challenging for condo developments, especially when the affordability is up to 60% AMI. There's a risk that if the AMI levels are not changed, uh, that buy right development could occur, especially for smaller sites. Uh, this means that the developer could redevelop a site without using the neighborhood form based code and providing any affordability. In fact, there's a recent example of 4238 Columbia Pike, which opted to develop by right into 17 townhomes, and the developer indicated this was in part due to the affordability requirements of up to 60% AMI, which were considered too onerous. Um, next slide. And we've received input from some members of the community questioning why staff is not recommending the number of affordable units be increased. Again, the current requirement is for 20% to 35% of net new units to be affordable. Feedback from real estate representatives indicates some developments may remain economically infeasible, even at ranges up to 80% and 100% AMI. This is because total development costs, which include land acquisition, may be equivalent or higher than the sale price of an 80% or even 100% AMI unit. And so the increase in sale price due to the AMI increases does not necessarily translate into increased profits for a developer. And the outcome of increasing the number of required units may result in buy right development and no on-site affordability. And therefore, staff recommends the required number of affordable units stay as is. Next slide. I'm actually going to hand it back over to my colleague, Akiri Abram. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So staff's proposal is that we apply a tiered approach. Applying a tiered approach would ensure that we have more households uh, that would qualify under this program. Uh, so as you can see, under uh, the proposed amendment, households earning between 61% and 100% of the area median income would now qualify. Um, and we are seeing firsthand the challenges of households at 60% of AMI to maintain ownership, uh, which is uh, the primary reason for us to uh, look at this amendment and, and revisit it. Next slide. So officially, staff is recommending that no less than one half of units required um, be affordable to households earning up to 80% of the area median income, and the remainder be affordable up to 100% of AMI. Um, staff is recommending that the terms be adjusted um, from 30 years or per perpetuity um, to for the life and use of the existing improvement as a residential dwelling unit. And that, that really um, is uh, from guidance from the county attorney's office. Um, and lastly, this amendment does not include any changes to the rental AMI levels or terms. And I'll turn it back over to Melissa for a condominium conversion discussion. Thank you. Uh, the last piece of our amendment is, has been to do with condominium conversion. So additionally, staff is proposing adding clarifying language for what happens to affordable rental units in instances where an approved and constructed neighborhood form based code rental building decides to convert to condominiums. Clarifying language states that the owner must notify the county of the condominium conversion and identify which of the rental units would either remain rental for the remainder of the compliance period or convert to affordable condominiums per the neighborhood form based code ownership affordability requirements. And it's intended to be clarifying language only. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Next slide. 
Next slide. In terms of next steps, we do have a Housing Commission meeting on October 8th and then a County Board meeting on uh, October 17th um, or October 20th. And finally, if you go to the next slide, um, the staff recommendation is to adopt the attached ordinance to amend, reenact, and recodify the Arlington County Zoning Ordinance, Article 11.2, Section 902, um, CPN, FBC, Columbia Pike Neighborhoods Form Based Code Districts, Appendix B, to adjust the area median income limit for affordable home ownership units from 60% of AMI to new limits that range up to 80% of AMI and up to 100% of AMI, while extending the affordability term for such units. And this stipulates standards for condominium conversion of affordable rental units that are developed under the neighborhood form based code. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Machuzek, Ms. Brown, and Ms. Donowski. Madam Clerk, I understand we have public speakers for this item. Yes, we do. Uh, let me see if I can do this correctly tonight. Here we go. Thank you. Voila. So as shown, our first speaker for the evening is John Snyder. Welcome, Mr. Snyder. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Guerin. Uh, I'm John Snyder, uh, and I live along the pike, and I've been involved in the form-based code development for the last 20 years. We've had two main principles through all the development of the form-based codes. The first is that we not do anything that will incentivize displacement of existing residents. It's one of the reasons why the commercial form-based code only applied to commercial buildings. The second is that we respect the neighborhoods. This proposal should not be adopted because it fails in both of these principles. The neighborhood form-based code set up incentives to allow the um, owner of the property to have three or four times as much density if and only if they preserved the 60% AMI units that are existing there today. This proposal would take that same incentive and apply it to removal of the 60% AMI property uh, units in favor of units at 80 or 100% percent in ownership opportunities. And while promotion of home ownership is a very positive thing, it should not be at the expense of current residents who are at 60 percent AMI. It's not only tough to afford a condominium at 60 percent AMI, it's tough to find a rental unit at that rate, which is why we're so committed to preserving the 6,000 market rate affordable units that we have. Um, as it relates to the neighborhoods, the neighborhoods agreed to, and I was a civic association president at the time, so very familiar with this discussion, the neighborhoods agreed to this additional density only to protect the homes of our neighbors. We did not do it because we like big buildings. We did not do it because we wanted someone else to move into the neighborhood. It was to keep our neighbors. By flipping the incentive toward displacement, this is breaching the trust with the neighborhoods that was part of the plan from the beginning. There has to be another way to reach this goal. Um, one of the things that is brought up is that it's not thought that it's going to be a lot of condominiums being built because it's 4% now. But if that prediction is not correct, it's kind of like the predictions we had on COVID. If it's not right, there's nothing we can do about it. There's no part of this proposal that would stop the redevelopment of these buildings into condominiums and exclude our current residents. So when we're talking about home ownership, that's great. But the first step under this proposal is to evict the current residents. That's simply not acceptable. So this proposal should be rejected. Thank you. Our next uh, thank speaker. You, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Oh. Snyder. I'm sorry, Jim. Okay, all right. thank you, Mr. Snyder. Uh, our next speaker is Eric Berkey. Three minutes. Thanks, Jim. Uh, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. 
Uh, I'm Eric Berkey. I live in uh, Douglas Park, Long Columbia Pike, uh, and I'm here in my uh, personal capacity. Um, I'd just like to associate myself with uh, John's comments, and I think that you'll see, given the speakers um, that have signed up for tonight's meeting, um, there's a cross-section of folks in Arlington who feel compelled to speak up uh, about these proposed amendments. Um, I'm here to request that you re recommend that the county board reject this proposal and instead direct staff to consider ways to promote affordable home ownership in the upcoming review of the county's affordable housing master plan. Um, I joined housing issues in the housing commission because of my support for affordable housing and my concern about the shrinking amount of affordable housing, especially market rate units. Um, you know, replacing them is ex very expensive. We spend between 80 to $120,000 of county loan funds to support, uh, you know, new affordable units. So I think we can agree that preserving the current market rate units we have must be a paramount goal of all of our affordable housing strategies. And what's so unfortunate is in pursuit of another laudable goal, which is uh, affordable home ownership, this policy will likely have the result of encouraging redevelopment of current existing marks, which will displace hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, current Arlington residents. So where's the causality? Why could this happen? It's because it would provide incentives. There would be less subsidy needed from these developers for the affordable units. And so it would be more advantageous. And we're going into a market that is currently dormant, and the county is actually putting its thumb on the scale to encourage this action. Um, and while I think it's a little silly to say that we want a new policy, but we don't think it's going to be successful, like John said, if this happens, there's nothing we can do to, to turn back time. The county says things like, well, if this happens, there's tenant relocation plans. Look, those are great tools when development is already happening and we need to mitigate effects, but that is little solace to current residents. That is not a policy that we should be promoting as a first course of action. That is a last course of action, okay? So, you know, we need to pursue these, these strategies, but this needs to be part of more holistic review. This is a good idea to pursue home ownership in an affordable way, but this is a bad policy. And, um, you know, look, this is just my view and John's view and others, folks. But look, look at the folks who are on the call tonight. Um, the county staff has reached out to groups like the Alliance for Housing Solutions, the Northern Virginia Affordable Housing Alliance. They got briefings on this. Um, they're not currently supporting this proposal, okay? There are a lot of other groups who have issues, too, so you don't have to just take my word for it. Um, I just think it makes little sense for the county to adopt a policy, which is going to have as an effect the substantial likelihood of creating massive displacement in one of the most uh, diverse corridors of our county. Um, we should be using density to encourage and create affordable housing, not to lead to at least inadvertent destruction and displacement of residents. Um, so thanks for the time, and I just, uh, again, ask that you reject this proposal and direct staff to look at uh, affordable ownership units in the affordable housing uh, review. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berkey. Ms. Our Johnson? next, sure. Our next speaker is Anne Bodine. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair and fellow commissioners. My name is Anne Bodine. I'm a 30-year resident of Arlington. I live in Lion Park. Uh, it's my first time speaking to your commission, so I welcome the opportunity. I ask that the Planning Commission reject the proposed change of AMI parameters that guide builders providing housing under the neighborhood form-based code. Please recommend that the board keep eligibility levels for the ownership program at 60% of AMI, and that it not grant bonus density for developers beyond what was already approved under the neighborhood form-based code. In no case should density be added or additional residents displaced without revealing to all residents the fiscal consequences and likely consequences for demographic change that these proposals would lead to. Specifically, I object to displacement of low and middle income residents, particularly in favor of households who earn more and are better able to find other exist existing housing. I object to tinkering with only a seven-year-old policy that resulted from expansive rejiggering of zoning in a major corridor. Foreign-based code should be respected and not seen as another tool that is constantly tweaked in favor of developers. I object to the loss of relatively affordable market rate rental units because of the further incentivization of condo buildings over rentals. I object to granting new extensive new density for builders who provide only one new affordable ownership unit. I object to the concept that density is an end in and of itself with no concern whether we keep current residents into our 2040 stats. I object to the spillover effect of increased density, namely inflated land values, which will make existing housing more expensive for renters and owners 
and potentially pushing out fixed lower and middle income owners who cannot keep up with the new tax assessments. I object to the complete lack of planning and budgeting for schools, parks, roads, transit, libraries, water, sewage, infrastructure, and increased public services. I object to likely outcomes that alter the racial and ethnic balance in favor of non-Latino, white, wealthy newcomers by supporting all demographic groups who are currently here, particularly concerning in areas that have been historically African-American since the Civil War. I'd just like to add, after hearing those, the uh, briefing, that it seems to me that you are saying to those people earning 60 percent of AMI that it's too bad to be in your situation and you won't get new jobs and you won't get salary increases. And to me, this is drawing a new kind of red line, and we want to avoid that. In a county of such staggering wealth, can't we find a way to help people cover their HOAs? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bodine. Our next speaker will be Julius Spain Sr., followed by Reginald Nixon. Welcome, Mr. Spain. Hey, hello. My name is Julia Spain. I'm the president of Arlington Branch NAACP, and I'm also an 11 year resident of the community. <laughs> so, for 111 years, the NAACP has been at the forefront of civil rights, advocating for access to affordable housing, combating housing discrimination, and having continued to fight to eliminate restrictive housing practices in public and private housing and some lending practices as well. A few months ago, I went before the county board on behalf of the 600 odd members of the Arlington Branch NAACP and provided some input to express our reservations about the residential portion of this amendment, particularly regarding the timeliness and the expedited nature of it. While we praised the county board for, for postponing a decision on this amendment, after speaking with many members of our organization, and in the community, the position of the Arlington Branch NAACP regarding this change to the form-based code has materially not changed because the conditions under which this amendment is being made themselves have not changed. What is being proposed is a continued gentrification of our historic community, an unnecessary cultural displacement of our many vulnerable citizens. Again, I appreciate that the housing division has taken certain measures to respond to the community input and held meetings with several key stakeholders like the NAACP. However, we also remain unconvinced that this amendment should go forth given the unpredictable dynamics of the real estate market as a result of this national pandemic, pandemic COVID-19, not to mention the perilous social, medical, employment situations of so many renters and long-time residents in the area of consideration. Finally, therefore, this is, it is the current position of the Orange and Branch NAACP today that consideration of this amendment be postponed indefinitely until after the current social and economic crisis, both locally and nationally, have largely subsided. We urge you to take our position under careful consideration. We likewise request that any future revival of this proposed amendment includes considerations of equity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Spain. And our last speaker on this topic is Reginald Nixon. Welcome, Mr. Nixon. You're muted, sir. Go ahead and unmute yourself and start again. We can't hear you. Mr. Nixon, you're muted. Mr. Nixon, can you unmute yourself? Can staff give Mr. Nixon some technical assistance with this?
Do you see where your controls are in the in the bottom part of the screen? And why don't you click the mute button and then unclick it again and just see if that does anything. Um, and also the volume button on your computer, perhaps. I'm sorry, sir, we can't hear you. Can you call? Uh, I'm sure. I'm sorry. I'm sure. Yeah. My suggestion. Oh. Ms. Johnson, can you post the phone number? Mr. Nixon, can you telephone in? Sure. Thank you. Actually, I have his number. Let me call him. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Johnson, are you able to reach him? Yes, that's correct. The line off. Ms. Johnson, are you able to reach Mr. Nixon? Yes, I'm speaking with him currently. Okay. I'm walking him through. Thank you. He's going to call my phone and I'm going to put him on speaker. Excellent. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Okay, Reggie. All right. Yes, it's a little fuzzy, so speak very clearly. We want to hear what you have to say. I'll do my best. Thank you. We can't hear you. You can't hear him? I can't hear him. Now I can, yes. Okay. All right. That sounds better. I can hear you. Yes. Are you still speaking? Because I can't hear you anymore. Can you hear me any better now? Turn off any other devices you have. Right. I don't have any 
the other devices off. Turn your volume down a little bit, Reggie. All right. And is that better? Yes. Okay. All right. I, I apologize, Kat. Um, I, uh, you'll have to forgive my, uh, my uh, stilted presentation skills. It's been 20 years since I've been before at the planning commission. I represent Columbia Heights Civic Association. And uh, we strongly oppose this proposal on six main points. Uh, it creates incentives for developers to accelerate displacement of existing residents as previously discussed and uh, to replace them with a more homogenous white, wealthier population. Secondly, we feel that it is an inappropriate use, use of affordable housing tools uh, because high income families are most likely to benefit who have the greatest mobility and choice of housing. Um, and it is significantly above the 60% uh, AMI that predominates the Columbia Pike Corridor. Thirdly, it enables severe bonus building heights, some six stories in excess of uh, permitted 12 to 14 story limits especially along the east end of the pipe. Such building heights, if approved, would create significant height discrepancies with adjoining properties that lack the height tapering consistent with site plan development along the Rosalind Boston corridor. Fourth, uh, there would be an enormous impact on infrastructure as already previously mentioned. Transportation, water, sewage, pedestrian activity and safety have not been fully addressed in the planning process of this proposal. Fifth, the board has been revising zoning and bulk regulations to accommodate almost every project resulting in exceeding project footprints that are inconsistent with the original form based code. And finally, the most impacted by this proposal have not been fully consulted. The magnitude of this proposal requires extensive community outreach and feedback that has not adequately taken place. In conclusion, we do not feel this proposal is ready to move forward. The county board needs to reconsider whether affordable housing tools are appropriately applied for residents whose incomes exceed 80% of the AMI and whether it is more equitable to include the existing community residents whose incomes approximate closer to 60% of the AMI. Thank you. Is that good? I finished. Madam Chair, I believe you're on mute. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Ms. Johnson, did that conclude our public speakers? 
Yes, Mr. Dempsey was not able to stay online, so that's why the strike threw his name. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Thanks, everyone, for your patience with us. Um, <clears throat> did any other commissions hear this? Seeing none, I'd like to ask what the form, neighborhood form-based code, um, the auxiliary working group thought of this. Commissioner Hughes? Thank you, Commissioner Gehring. As those of you who do know, uh, the form-based code, uh, AUG, Auxiliary Working Group, uh, I chair um, as a county manager appointed uh, committee. It is not a commission of the Planning Commission, uh, the members of which represent the civic associations along the pike. We actually heard this item uh, whoo, three years ago. If staff school correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the staff report addresses is 2017, I want to say off the top of my head. Um, the the substance of the change is very minimal from that point uh, forward. Staff uh, has adjusted it slightly from that time period. That was uh, resoundingly rejected by my members. Uh, the latest one came forward to us right before we went into lockdown, uh, and I would describe it as lukewarm uh, with some reservations on that, primarily because it was heard at the same time as the adjoining amendment to uh, revise the um, the one we did in July. My head is, is, is getting late, so it's a little foggy on it for the moment, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, oh, the, uh, oh, it's killing me, I've lost it. So that's, Madam Chair, that's the primary basis of it. So the AUG heard it, lukewarm would be described the uh, most recent uh, meetings uh, example, uh, and the uh, reservations that we've heard this evening were mirrored within that conversation as well. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Um, we're ready for our Zoco report then. Commissioner Weir or Commissioner Patel? Thank you, Thank you Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. I, I have, have circulated a copy of the report. Um, uh, I, uh, my apologies for the late hour in which I submitted it. Uh, I'll just say that the um, committee heard this item twice on uh, March 3 and September 23, uh, and the concerns <clears throat> uh, that the committee heard um, have all been raised uh, so far this evening, but they focused on uh, gentrification, increased condo fees over time, uh, concerns about accelerating gentrification, uh, um, uh, uh, displacement, uh, the appropriate AMI thresholds, um, and, and sort of the broader philosophical goals of affordable uh, ownership housing, uh, as well as questions about resale. Um, Commissioner Hughes has uh, uh, submitted a number of questions um, that could be uh, discussed. I, I think that they broadly fall under the category of remaining technical questions or concerns. Um, uh, while I pull them up, let me see if I can find them real quickly, actually. I have uh, this. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave those to your discretion. Uh, other topics that I had raised were ramifications of non-action and action, uh, respectively, concerning um, this, this proposed amendment uh, and consistency of the proposed changes within a broader Arlington policy, as well as other topics recommended by the Commission. The one um, point that I want to make before I finish my report as the chair um, is is that I, I want to challenge commissioners to um, to realize that one of the things that we've heard is that this amendment would um, uh, bring policies in Columbia Pike into comportment with countywide policies. Now, we've heard from public commenters, and rightly so, that there are lots of very good reasons uh, to question whether or not um, countywide policy mm -hmm. is appropriate for Columbia Pike specifically. Um, um, but uh, uh, I, I want us in our, I want, I want to encourage my fellow commissioners to be thinking uh, as we, as we um, discuss this, not just are there specific uh, uh, factors along Columbia Pike that need to be considered, but at the same time, um, is, is this a conversation that we're having about a zoning policy along Columbia Pike uh, uh, or um, is are we being asked to have a conversation about countywide uh, affordable homeownership policy um, 
generally and sort of then being asked to have that within the context of this Columbia Pike thing. And if it's if it's the latter, um, to challenge people to to remember that we're not litigating countywide policy here. We're 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 talking about uh, what's the right. Um, uh, position for um, for Columbia Pike, and that that might sound like I'm, t I'm I'm sort of leading the discussion to a particular direction. I do have my own thoughts that I'll bring out when we get to that point, um, uh, but I'm I'm very much just trying to help us structure uh, our thinking of it in the way that that I, as the chair, have been asked to um, struggle with it in my own thinking as we move along. So, uh, with that, I will uh, yield the floor back to the chair. Thank you, Commissioner Ware. <clears throat> so, as if I understand this correctly, then we will structure our discussion, and I'll give some categories right now. But I'd like to hear if someone has something specific. Um, Commissioner Ware, let me know if I have this right. We'll look at the ramifications of non-action if the amendment doesn't go forward, the ramifications of action if it's passed, the consistency of the proposed change within the broader Arlington County policy, and then Commissioner Hughes's technical questions, which. I believe were clarifying questions. How are AMI units conveyed, sold, and operated? And what are the existing requirements in the neighborhood form based code? Are there other points or issues we'd like to include in our discussion? Not from me, but I'm certainly eager to hear whether or not our colleagues have anything. Yes, thanks, Commissioner Ware. Um, guys, I'm just going to look and see if you either raise your hand or you unmute. Perhaps raise your hand since. I'm not seeing any raised hands. Colleagues, let me know if I've missed you, but I don't see anybody unmuted nor raised hands other than Ms. Johnson. Okay, well, let's start with those then. Commissioner Weir, would you um, start us off with the ramifications of non-action and action? Sure. So, you know, one of the one of the questions that I had asked with staff, and I'm going to ask staff to, to talk about this um, uh, a little bit, uh, but but one of the questions that came up during the zoning committee meeting um, a, a few weeks ago was what happens if what what could we expect to happen if the board doesn't pass on this uh, doesn't doesn't um, excuse me uh, if the board doesn't adopt this proposed uh, amendment over the next year uh, and at the same time um, uh, if if that if there's anything beyond what has been said in the proposal so far um, what what do we what can we reasonably expect to see in terms of especially responding to public concern uh, 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 in, in, in terms of gentrification and displacement over the next um, year or so uh, should the board adopt this change? Staff? And I apologize for not having my video on. Oh, yeah, I'd love to see the videos when you are speaking. Could someone from staff um, respond to Commissioner Weir's queries? Sure. This is Melissa Donowski, and I'll let my colleagues at, at Carrie and Matt chime in on this. And I think the first part of your question was essentially, what are the ramifications of not acting? And, um, you know, I think one of the, the biggest ramifications is that we could put homeowners in a precarious or unstable position. Um, you know, there's a lot of challenges of, of home ownership at the 60% AMI level, and, and I can let Akira talk about that a little bit more in a moment, and I know she talked about it through her presentation. Um, also, it's just, it's not consistent, and staff believes not equitable with how ownership units are treated throughout the county, where it is at least up to 80% AMI, and it may limit home ownership opportunities on Columbia Pike. And lastly, there could be a risk of buy-right development. As I mentioned before, um, affordable units up to 60% AMI is, is very challenging. And there already was an example of a, a property that did develop by right because the AMI levels um, were seen as too onerous. Thank you, Ms. Donowski. Commissioner Hughes? Thanks, Commissioner Beer. I, I want to go back to Melissa's comment just there. Um, with respect to the buy right choice, uh, what impact does staff see this having on that choice uh, with respect to, for example, the town unit development? You stated there, uh, what would have precluded the owner from have just done an apartments versus the condo? What would this change make materially different in that business decision? 
That's a that's a really good question and um, something that um, I actually meant to bring up earlier but didn't is that um, the decision to do condo developments or rental development is is a market decision by the developer and. I don't think it's necessary. I don't. We don't. Staff doesn't believe that this change in the AMI will sway the business plan of that developer from going from rental to condo. However, what we've seen with that example of the development that went by right is that it could sway it from being a condo development under the neighborhood form based code to being a by right ownership development. So, in other words, you can miss out altogether on the opportunity. Um, to develop under neighborhood form based code. Um, that it, and but in that example, staff the developer. Go ahead. In, the, in that example, staff just laid out, if you believe there's no difference between condo and apartment, then why would you believe there is within, within the neighborhood form based code? Why would you believe that changing it to condo would create an incentive or would create a difference in decision from that to a by right development? Sorry, so raising the AMI levels for a condo development could help make um, the development economically feasible, whereas otherwise it would not be feasible. That I think drives to the heart of, of what many in the community have, have outlined in their public comments this evening with respect to uh, incentivizing development with respect to it. Um, so I appreciate that. I do have a follow-up question, Madam Chair, if I can. Uh, yes, Mr. That. Machusik also has his hands up. Can I just ask if that's in relation to Mr. To Commissioner Hughes' we'll, question? We'll let Matt go. Yeah. I, I think my intent is to circle back to what um, Commissioner Weir initially posed. Oh. Okay. Commissioner Hughes, then then Mr. Machusik. Thank you. A uh, question for staff with respect to uh, the existing status quo. Would anything prevent a developer from developing under the Columbia Pike form based neighborhood form based code? And instead of selling all of their units outright uh, as condo units, instead holding those units in either an escrow account or in some way, shape, or form, transferring it to a nonprofit developer or any other entity that then in turn lease those units out for the duration of the 30 year period to 60% AMI unit holders. Thanks for that question. Um, my interpretation um, is under the structure that you propose, where essentially the developer would sell the units to a nonprofit or affordable housing um, uh, owner to essentially run the units as affordable rental units for the 30 year compliance period. Um, that, that I don't see any restrictions that would prohibit that. It would certainly have to be worked out up front in the housing plan that's submitted as part of the neighborhood's form based code, but I don't see anything that would necessarily prohibit that now. Okay, just wanted to make sure I understood correctly. So there is nothing inside the current status quo uh, neighborhood service code that would preclude a building from being developed, those units being essentially sold to a holding entity that's entire purpose was created for respect to leasing them out for the duration of the period at 60% AMI. Just wanted to confirm that for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Mr. Matusek? Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the things that struck me uh, throughout this process is uh, I think many of the concerns that lie with um, to my camera on uh, the I guess what people are calling acceleration of change um, and are we taking on actions and proposing amendments that would expedite the rate at which redevelopment happens and therefore have a significant impact on the Columbia Pike community um, and that particularly I think becomes problematic when we revisit many of the uh, neighborhoods area plan uh, recommendations that specifically are trying to target uh, this, this magical number of 6,200 uh, market rate affordable units that at that point were on Columbia Pike and we wanted to make sure that as redevelopment happened and allowed us to you know, achieve a lot of different community benefits along Columbia Pike, portions of that number would continue to be preserved on site with each redevelopment proposal. Uh, and one of the things that strikes me is that I actually view other uh, elements that are at play here that I think speak directly to how redevelopment is accelerated. Um, and more particularly, how those different elements tie into the loss of marks countywide, but also on Columbia Pike. And, and one of the things I wanted to do is I'm going to share my screen to capture this one slide we uh, did not use in our main presentation. but it highlights the conditions under which the neighborhood's area plan was developed uh, by referring to the period in the early 2000s and capturing 
how were we losing those market rate affordable units countywide? How was that happening? Uh, and I think this was very telling in that you can see how just how much of those units simply became unaffordable through rent increases, renovations, um, and things that have nothing to do to what the form-based code uh, tries to achieve on, on different sites. Um, so that pressure there, the reality that those marks were being lost, was already some like an existing condition, if you will. What the neighborhood's form-based code did is in itself, by trying to utilize urban, uh, urban uh, design and smart growth principles, it actually serves as its own accelerated mechanism for redevelopment because it offers a new incentive to property owners beyond the buy right potential to consider something different. Um, so those two elements by themselves already expedite the rate at which redevelopment can happen. Um, some even highlight the Amazon effect that, you know, simply by having this huge tenant nearby in Pentagon City and Crystal City, that in itself creates even more pressure. So the reason I'm highlighting all of these things is because whether this amendment goes forward or not, they will continue to be there and the rate at which property owners are feeling this pressure will continue to exist. And while we, I think we can effectively, uh, reasonably document that the proposed change is not expediting it, I also don't want to lose sight of the fact that the pressures that are cur currently facing property owners and renters along Columbia Pike are not going away simply because this amendment doesn't go forward. Uh, and I think it's an important distinction to make as we go forward in tonight's discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Machusek. I appreciate you raising that. I'm sensitive to what we heard from a lot of the community, uh, that they have s some serious fears and concerns that this will actually trigger that sort of redevelopment displacement. And it's helpful to hear you putting that in the context of the trends that you've actually seen over the last few years. Uh, Commissioner Hughes, follow up? Your hand is still up. Sorry, dropping it. Okay, so um, we've addressed the ramifications of action and non-action. Commissioners, let's move on to some of the other points. The consistency of the proposed changes with the broader Arlington County policy. I think I have a good understanding of this. It looks like we have two plans that are already in place, the Affordable Housing Master Plan uh, adopted about five years ago in the neighborhood, um, form-based code area plan adopted perhaps seven years ago. Um, can staff, Clarify for us how, how how these changes work with those plans. Mr. Machusek or Ms. Brown? Sure, I can I can begin with the neighborhoods area plan um, in that. And let me see if we can bring up the um, actually I think Ebony who's on the call. Would you be able to bring up slide? 14 for us, because um, I think that gets into the um, specifics. Uh, and again, uh, I think some that are on the call or are likely watching, I think we're heavily involved in that process that took place from 2008 to 2012. Um, and as you go through the recommendations uh, towards the end of that document, um, it is very clear that the emphasis for rental units is up to 60% AMI, uh, and then households uh, who may be uh, targeted for ownership opportunities should be somewhere between 60 and 120 percent. Um, so that that distinction is very clear in the neighborhoods area plan. Uh, however, given the sites that we were considering during the development of the neighborhoods farm based code that would implement that vision, uh, much of the focus was on rental development. Uh, that was obviously informed by development trends at the time, but also given the nature of the sites that are currently governed, um, by the neighborhoods form based code. Very few were condominiums as well. Uh, and again, much of our discussion and focus was simply on that housing product. Um, but nonetheless, I think the guidance uh, that I think is informing our analysis, although just as you know, one data point, does specifically talk about 60 to 120 percent of the AMI. And as, I can, as you can see, staff's current proposal is exactly in the middle of that range. Uh, thank you, Mr. Machusek. Commissioner Weir, did I correctly convey your point in the staff report, in your report with that? Yes. Okay, great. Commissioner Hughes, your hand is still up. Did you have a question? No, no ma'am, it's not. 
Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'll go through the, the rest of the issues that were raised, and then, um, Commissioners, feel free to let me know if you have questions or concerns about any of these. Uh, Commissioner Hughes had raised some technical questions, and um, Stephen, please let me know if I don't get these correct. How are AMI units in the county conveyed, sold, and operated? Uh, thanks, Commissioner. Here, and only because I believe we have some new commissioners, and this will come up every single time we have this condo conversation. So, I, yeah. and since we have the expert in Akira here, I, yeah. I think it'd be best to just knock them out real quick. So, Akira, these are, are real softballs for you, but they'll hopefully he'll hopefully make all my uh, colleagues understand how to interpret everything. Uh, let's just go with the 80% AMI number. If we price a condo unit at 80% AMI unit, the price that we sell the unit at is designed for 80% AMI, but a 60% AMI household could qualify for it if they can pay the 80% AMI number. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Uh, and if you, your slide presentation was excellent with respect to the AMI changes and showed the two year change, and in your case, it was 300 to $309,000. That applies all directions. So the if the AMI were to go down in the area, the sale price would go down as well, correct? No, it does not. Okay. If the AMI goes down, the, the AMI uh, criteria does not change for that particular year. The sale? So if, if, say, let's just say the AMI goes down 2%. Um, that property would remain at the, uh, the previous value for the, the next year. So essentially, there is no, um, there's no negative value associated with an affordable ownership unit, even if the AMI decreases. To your decrease, any change to that statement? Nope. Okay, so 300 never, goes above, uh, never drops below 300, but it also doesn't raise, correct? That's correct. Great, great to know. Um, the other thing, so it's it, the price is tied to the AMI, and then the uh, the sale conveys to the AMI level. I just want to make sure that everyone understands that because there's always a thousand questions around that when we, we get this sure. in the site plan. Yeah, sure, Stephen. So yeah, the price is is directly correlated with the AMI, and what we do initially for for the initial uh, sales price is we basically use a formula to back in to uh, the sales price by um, there are a number of assumptions like um, the interest rate and, and a host of other things. But essentially, um, households would not be paying more than 33% of their monthly income towards uh, the mortgage as well as the condo fees. So that's essentially, um, in a nutshell, how we come up with that initial price. And then subsequent um, resales are based on the, uh, the increase of the AMI year over year. And just to be clear, if 100% AMI is the price point, an 80% AMI family could qualify if they can pay the 100% AMI price. That's correct. Right. Just want to make sure we did that for my colleagues uh, to run through that again and for the public. Thank you. Good points. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Sure. Um, and then, Commissioner Hughes, you'd also raise the question about the existing requirements in the neighborhood form based code. Did you want to speak to that? Uh, I'll take this moment just because it's on the, if you have, uh, I always want to plug this. I, I think that the, the neighborhoods form based code is the gold standard of affordable housing inside of our county. Nowhere else in our county do we guarantee to achieve at every single site a number of affordable housing units greater than or equal to the need we identified in the AHMP. That is so far unmatched in any planning area. I encourage those in active planning areas to meet that targeting goal or exceed it. But my point to bring that forward is it is the gold standard with respect to affordable housing. And as uh, you know, John and, and Mr. Spain already mentioned, it was designed that way for a reason. And I will tell you the first time that the uh, this came before the AUG, the members asked only one question, how could we lower it? Uh, was honestly their fundamental feedback. So uh, it's with pride that uh, many of my members have that position. And so I just want to make sure that we all, we all knew that that was out there. Um, but it is a non, you cannot get out of that requirement. There is no buying out, there's no way out of it. If you develop under the neighborhoods form based code, you will have an affordable housing contribution. How much is the question, but it will always be greater than the AHMP. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Hughes. That's an excellent point and really great to know. Kudos to your community for managing to get that in there. Commissioner Schroll had a follow-up for Mr. Matusek. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Matusek, in your response regarding um, uh, how this proposal aligns with the policy uh, guidance of the Columbia Pike Plan, you referenced the language about ownership. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to how staff believes um, the proposal uh, relates to the guidance um, regarding retention of marks. So there's uh, guidance there about retention of 100% of existing marks. Um, and then also the, um, if you could also speak in your response to staff's opinion of uh, how the conversion language um, in the staff's proposal uh, relates to the guidance regarding retention of CAFs. Sure, I can begin and uh, let housing staff as well kind of chime in since I think this really covers um, more of that element of the proposal. But really I think overarching to what you just mentioned is the fact that we are not changing anything that deals with the great majority of projects that have and will continue to come to Columbia Pike, which are rental projects. Those will continue to assist and provide housing for folks earning up to 60% AMI, consistent with the requirement Commissioner Hughes just mentioned that every site needs to deliver. Uh, and that is going to remain a tool serving folks that are in those AMI categories. So from our perspective, that relationship and staff's con commitment to what's pretty much been the, you know struck back in 2012 with the neighborhoods area plan that's still intact and we're not you know shying away from that at all i think what we're recognizing is that even back then there was uh you know the document was alluding to a distinguished a, a distinction between the rental and ownership uh, properties and because of that uh, we are informed now by so much more analysis, research, the true need in uh, Arlington County and Columbia Pike, and really what it takes for a common development to materialize. Um, and I think while this is not a driver for the entire process, certainly being aware that if not done correctly, we may not have any you know, affordable ownership opportunities along Columbia Pike. That certainly is something that we have to consider um, among many other elements that are at play here, certainly uh, the community that lives along the corridor today. Um, but I did want to have housing staff, I think, maybe weigh in on those other uh, elements that you just mentioned. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt. If I could just jump in. Um, since the Neighborhoods Area Plan was approved in 2012, there's been over 840 committed affordable rental units that were approved and added to the committed affordable housing inventory. And staff continues to work towards meeting these the projections um, to preserve uh, marks through development of community affordable units. In fact, last February, there was a new 77 uh, unit community affordable development that was approved by the county board at Arlington View Terrace in Eastern Columbia Pike. And all units at this development will be under 60% AMI. And in fact, some of the units will be even lower uh, at up to 30% AMI. And all this is to say that staff will continue to seek opportunities to serve households under 60% AMI through both the neighborhood form-based code and financial resources. Um, I don't think that these are opposing goals to preserve marks, but also provide home ownership opportunities, but almost complementary goals. Um, thank you to you both. Madam Chair, if I might ask yes. one follow-up. Um, maybe this is um, better for Melissa. Um, so with the, um, this is about the, the condo conversion language. So with respect to your answer about the CAF preservation. So please help me understand this. So if there's a proposal, like a project that comes forward on the form-based code and it had CAFs up to 60% AMI for 30 years, and then 10 years into the ownership of that develop project, it converts to a condo. And we walk me through that process. So we do we lose the CAFs or some, some portion of them and they could become up to 80% AMI or and some up to 100% AMI? Walk me through that. 
So in that situation, the developer would have to notify us, and there would essentially be two options, which is the units could continue as rental units, affordable rental units, um, or the would have the option to um, convert those to affordable condominium units per the neighborhood form-based code and county board approval. I will say, though, that it's difficult for um, to, for a, a condominium association to run rental units, and it, we've seen challenges with that in the past. Um, so that's why there would be those two options, and you know, it would, it would be up to the developer to, to choose which option. Um, I think uh, Commissioner Hughes did mention too that it, it could be possible um, to essentially um, partner maybe with a, a nonprofit. Uh, uh, owner, property manager to maybe run those units as CAF units for the um, condominium association, but it's it's that's really up to the developer. Um, and again, I think the reason that I brought up all the units that were approved, um, community affordable units um, that were approved using our county loan funds um, since the neighborhood a area plan approval was that you know the ma the majority of our CAFs have along Columbia Pike have also involved our county loan funds, and those have. Um, affordability commitments of 60 years or 75 years in many uh, more recent cases. So, you know, those units would remain affordable uh, rental units um, through the duration of the affordability period due to the county loan funds, which often is even longer than 30 years. Okay, I, that's helpful. Um, so depending on the financial structure, that would obviously play a role, as you just noted. And then, um, but if that weren't the case, then the property owner could convert the units um, and would have those two options that you mentioned. Right. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Melissa. Um, okay, I've got a question now. Given the concerns that have been raised, what are our options if we find after six months, eight months, 12 months, that this is having unintended consequences? This is for staff. Thanks. Uh, this is Melissa again, and I, um, uh, Matt Matusik may have things to add, but I think that there is definitely an ability to, and staff actually does monitor development trends and development patterns throughout the county, but there would be an opportunity to report back um, annually, if that's the preference, um, about uh, you know, the development trends, what's happening um, in the county, and to potentially relook at the amendment. I will say the neighborhood form based code does um, does get amended um, from time to time. Thank you, Ms. Janowski. Ms. Steinberger? Commissioner Steinberger? Excuse me. Oh, sorry, I had to get the, um, the mute and everything off. Um, so I guess, and I, I'm not exactly sure if this is the, I know we're still working through kind of the agenda of topics. I'm not sure if this is exactly the right moment to okay. kind of express this concern, but I, I'm just, and I, we've seen it in some of the comments, both spoken and, and, and written certainly. And I'm, I'm just dubious about the timing of this. And I share um, the concerns that our, our chair just expressed with regards to kind of what our options are if we're, this isn't working, but, at, at this moment, I'm I'm very concerned that with everything going on with COVID, with uncertainty about what's happening kind of in the housing market and economically and what development's even going to look like in a longer term run, I just don't understand making this change now. And I'm, I'm really struggling with that. Um, I know we're also as a county looking at a larger affordable housing um, master plan and we're looking at the missing middle study and we're, we're in the uh, of, a, of a bigger discussion here. And I'm, uh, I, I think that maybe if it was just the one and not the COVID, then I, I wouldn't be feeling as strongly as I am, but I'm just not getting it. Um, I'm in this moment, I'm, I'm very puzzled by making this any kind of a move of, of this magnitude at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Bagley. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, I want to align myself a little with Commissioner Steinberger. Uh, I am in the housing market. I do that professionally. And um, this is a troublesome thing for those of us who do it professionally. It's something we face every day as we have people that we can't find things for. And even for those people who we can, the question becomes how long can they even continue to afford it? So but I'm not sure I, in hearing everything, and very concerned with some of the speakers, their comments that were made tonight. Um, I know what's going on in the housing market right now. Uh, we have predictions of what uh, it will be coming up. But um, I, too, am also very uh, concerned about the timing and um, sort of, while I understand both sides, if we don't do something, we should do something, um, but I'm not convinced that this is the route to go right at the moment. So I just, I, I needed to say that. Thank you, Commissioner Bagley. Commissioner Morton, and then Ms. Janowski. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Danowski, I believe, just now raised this issue of monitoring, and I know this was seen as possibly a proposed motion. I'm wondering really what, because I'm not so familiar with what you generally do, what does that entail? And a couple of related comments. Um, a couple of times in the staff report, you mentioned this extensive economic analysis that's been conducted. And I wasn't exactly sure of the timing. At one point, you said it was in 2013. I imagine that you've done more recent uh, economic analysis that leads you to believe that it's not likely um, to get the, um, the additional development without this change. And I'll just add, since I'm speaking now, I do very much appreciate you grounding your analysis in these specific examples um, in the report. That's really helpful. But it, it also sort of makes it feel a bit anecdotal because there, there's really kind of few of them. And I'm, it leads me uh, in part to support what you're uh, doing because it, it grounds it, but it also leads me to support what I think I'm hearing, which is to ground it in a larger kind of analysis as you're going forward. So. Okay. okay. Commissioner Morton. Ms. Janowski, uh, did, you, did, yeah, did you want to respond? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I actually heard a series of questions, which I'm going to um, try my best to go through. So um, I think one of them was, um, you know, why, why are we moving forward with this amendment now? Why not wait? Um, and, and concerns of, of, how, of the pandemic and going forward with this amendment. And um, staff believes that, you know, this amendment is not directly impacted by the pandemic as the challenges of up to 60% of my units for home ownership remains, whether it occurs, you know, prior to or after a pandemic. In fact, this amendment first began around 2017 after the adoption of the Affordable Housing Master Plan staff um, had a meeting with the Form Based Code Advisory Working Group, as Commissioner Hughes mentioned, um, and then have, through time, uh, done uh, more analysis and are coming back um, with our um, revised recommendation for tiers at up to 80% AMI and 100% AMI. Um, and I do think that, you know, unfortunately, with the pandemic, it has created precarious employment opportunities or employment situations um, for many residents, and especially for residents that may earn up to 60% AMI. And I think this further highlights the challenges of ownership um, at this income level. But I did want to talk about monitoring and what that entails. Um, you know, I may need uh, Matt Matusik to chime in, but essentially, we do keep tabs on development and what is included, um, what is happening in the development community, um, and um, certainly keep tabs on all the neighborhood form-based code applications that come in um, and would be committed to continue to do that and to um, essentially learn from that. I think one of the reasons we're proposing this amendment at all is because we've learned a lot from what happened at Carver Homes. And uh, that, was, that was a big learning experience. And I think in terms of the, um, economic analysis, and uh, Matt Matuzic probably referred to the economic analysis done uh, in advance of the neighborhood form-based code, um, and that was very intensive. Um, but, you know, since then, as I mentioned, staff does continue to monitor development trends and patterns, um, many of which were presented in the presentation. Um, we've had discussions with developers as well um, about, you know, the economic impacts and um, 
with all that to say, that all fed into our recommendation to uh, adjust the area median income levels for ownership units. Thank you, Ms. Janowski. Commissioner Morton, did that answer your follow-up? Okay. Um, Mr. Machusik and then Commissioner Peterson. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and just to kind of supplement um, what we just heard about, you know, monitoring, uh, and I also want to discuss the economic analysis briefly, but, you know, for every project that I think the Planning Commission and County Board may see when any given year, staff actually talks with developers and property owners on two or three other projects that either are delayed or just never materialize. Um, so our discussions are much broader than one or two projects that may ultimately come to fruition and get approved and ultimately even built. Uh, so the portfolio that we're referencing and the data points are pretty vast. It, it is not just a matter of every couple of years a project may come in and we feel more confident about the research that we're uh, sharing with you this evening. Uh, and when we speak about monitoring, much of that analysis, if it were to happen, uh, even on an annual basis, um, is really informed by those preliminary conversations we have with property owners when they're just doing, you know, napkin sketches in front of us to figure out if they understand the form based code well, is there enough feasibility to make a project viable? Uh, and it's really in those early stages where we have a sense of whether or not something might be there for an actual project months away. And I'm highlighting that because I think the fear is when we consider monitoring or staff is committed to continually checking on progress and development trends, it doesn't really require us to have three, four, eight you know, projects be approved until we actually react. We can do that much sooner before things actually reach the planning commission and county board level because of those informal discussions that happen on an annual basis. So uh, it, it's important to highlight the fact that we can catch those much sooner and be become much more aware if there is a change in trends and continue to have our radar up moving forward. On the economic analysis side, I, I believe there's a undercurrent that I think is, is being ignored in some of the concerns that are raised. Um, and, and that is that much of the impact on existing residents, I think, is tied to the properties which currently house a lot of uh, folks in some of the mid-rise and high-rise buildings. This is especially true on the eastern part of Columbia Pike, where you currently have, particularly on the south side, um, a lot of mid-range buildings. Um, and the economic analysis that was done to inform the neighborhood's area plan is still relevant today, um, uh, even though staff continues to revisit those uh, data points. But what it really highlighted is that for those properties which currently have a mid-rise to a high-rise product, for them to consider a change, not only would the building need to be in pretty bad shape because renovations would no longer support its uh, longer uh, extension of useful life, but they would really need to consider something greater in height to really pull the trigger and actually you know, consider a change in redevelopment. Um, and for those properties, redevelopment is likely going to involve concrete construction. Following that logic, concrete construction in those sites is not really feasible until the rents that you can achieve, the market rate rents, not the affordable ones, but the market rate rents, until they can support concrete construction, those projects are unlikely. Now, I want to be clear that it's not, they're impossible, they're just very unlikely given everything we know and everything we've looked at. So a lot of those uh, properties, I think, are really subject to rents on Columbia Pike to continue to increase, uh, and they're currently are not anywhere near to support concrete construction of that nature. That would be a different story if you compare that to the RB corridor or even in Crystal City and Pentagon City, where you have Metro. Here, this is a different market. Uh, and so that economic analysis holds a lot of, I think, interesting facts that inform and allow us to, I think, carefully uh, respond to some of the concerns we've heard about displacement and what it might mean for the current residents. Thank you, Mr. Matusek. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you very much, um, Chair Guerin. Uh, so my question is um, kind of a community relations question, which is that we have Mr. Nixon from the Civic Association speaking out against this this policy, uh, Mr. Spain from the NAACP, Mr. Berkeley, who is uh, not speaking on behalf of the Housing Commission tonight, but is the chair, and all of these um, 
people from disparate organizations are are against this policy. And so I want to know kind of where we went wrong in messaging this and bringing the community into the conversation and getting buy-in from these these three important groups that um, have very similar points of view on why this isn't a great policy for Arlington County. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Peterson. I can start off with that and, and my colleagues can chime in. I think one of the um, one of the issues is that really staff was focused initially on the tenets of our policy guidance. And so looking at that policy guidance, looking at it through that lens, uh, we really felt that this was um, a strong um, direction for us to take. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that there could be additional um, engagement that we could undergo. Um, I think we do have a slide of um, the uh, the number of organizations that we have reached out to and had several conversations with. Um, and we understand uh, the, the sentiment, um, but I think that ultimately our initial response uh, was to really follow the guidance associated with the policies, policies that have been um, approved by the county board. Yeah, thank you so much, Ebony. So yeah, this just kind of highlights some of the um, the organizations that we um, reached out to and had substantial conversations with, understanding the parameters of their concerns um, and making some some shifts in, in our position based on uh, the parameters of, of those concerns. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues if anyone wants to uh, chime in further on that. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Mr. Machusek? Yeah, I, I I can't help but ignore, help to you know consider. I guess is is the consistency at which many of these groups I think continue to, um, you know, raise concerns and present I think um, their opposition to their recommendation, which I think staff takes very seriously. And many of us have spent a lot of time working on Columbia Pike, uh, and we are certainly mindful of making sure that whatever amendments we do consider are not going to have a negative impact. Um, and I think it's really visible as you read our staff report that the community engagement section is quite extensive. We've, we've taken and consolidated all the comments we've received over the last few months. We've revised our presentations to adequately respond to each of those questions. And I think we have a, a data-driven response that covers all those different concerns. Uh, yet I think the sentiment is still there um, that I think drives to a deeper discussion beyond just data analysis and economic research. Uh, but that is a, a very difficult, I think, element to address, uh, whether verbally or in a presentation, because I think the uh, what's become visible is that, is that folks really made up their mind early on. And, you know, despite even having further engagement, which we could continue to do, I'm not sure if some people are ultimately going to be convinced this is the right approach. Um, so I think rather than doing that, what we're, we're trying to focus on is how could we go a step further to mitigate those potential impacts, commit to monitoring development activity, and be prepared to address these in a future form-based code amendment, which is something we do all the time. Um, not to compare this to a much lighter subject, which of course didn't have anywhere near the, the type of feedback we have today, but you know, when we looked at recently the form-based code architecture, um, we knew that we were introducing elements that we have to wait, give them time to mature, see how the market responds, and be prepared to come back in five years if we start to see negative consequences. This is obviously a much more consequential issue, and we don't want to minimize it by this comparison, but it highlights the fact that, you know, this is just one of the many elements that are part of this bigger equation. You know, we talked about the lending practices, the market forces, what different property owners are considering at any given point. Um, there's a lot to consider here, and we recognize that the zoning ordinance is just one element of that. And accordingly, it can only influence so much of those decisions. Uh, but to the degree possible, I think we're making sure that through data, analysis, trends, and interviews, we give ourselves the best chance to make sure it succeeds in meeting our uh, earlier stated goals. Thank you, Mr. Matusek. 
I appreciate this reminder that we regularly do evaluate our processes and policies and amend them if they're not working. I also was grateful for your earlier discussion that pointed out that the pike is different from some of the other areas that we might individually be more familiar with, and that this proposal reflects a lot of economic analysis um, that is, in fact, meant to address the concerns about displacement that might come with redevelopment if we don't have policies in place to ensure that we get some affordable housing as part of those going forward. Um, I've been informed within the last couple of minutes that there's an automatic DTS update at 11, so we need to conclude our hearing by then. It is 1025 now. I'm very optimistic we can do that. I see that some of your hands are up, um, and I want to make sure that we all have a chance to raise our questions. So, Commissioner Steinberger, Commissioner Siegel, and then Commissioner Weir. I'm sorry. Right. Thank you. Um, and I, I understand I already spoke once, so I'll, I'll keep this brief. I, I do appreciate, and I've always, our staff is so conscientious about reaching out to the community, and um, I appreciate that that it really is the epitome of the Arlington way and something that, you know, really has brought certainly myself to this commission and I think a lot of us to this commission. Um, I, I am concerned that, and I think um, Commissioner Peterson put it very well in indicating what was missed in terms of a messaging. And I understand the desire to live to our values and, and sorry, not even values, it's, you know, the our standards and our, our practices for what we're trying to achieve and the metrics that we're using to make these recommendations and make these decisions. But if that's not mess if being conveyed to the community or that's not missing the mark or the community is telling us something else that they're seeing in the application and their fear of how this proposal is going to be applied, I just I struggle to get past that. And I'm, I'm kind of curious, just, um, you know, in, in the moment, you know, whether the community had already made up their minds to a degree about some of these proposal, some of this proposal or, or, or not, I, I can't necessarily speak to. But I, I do, I, what, what, di if the dialoguing that happened happened in the most productive way, and if there's something else with everything else going on in the in our community right now, I I come back to the fact that I don't think that this is the time to do this, um, and I'm 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 just not going to get past that. I'm sorry. Okay, thanks, Commissioner Steinberger, Commissioner Siegel, then Commissioner Weir. Uh, thank you, um, Commissioner Gearan. Uh, I think this question, I guess, is for Mr. Matusak or um, the other members of the housing staff. Um, in in your conversations, the ones that you mentioned uh, that you have um, on a more regular basis than what we might um, be exposed to, um, was there uh, and uh, was there expressed and and also when you spoke to the business community. Um, the interested business community about this proposal, uh, was their interest? Um, did this option, at least theoretically, when they're drawing things on a paper napkin, um, seemed tempting to them? Um, that That's one question. The other question that, that I would have, and perhaps Commissioner Hughes and certainly staff would might know this. I'm not asking for a full rundown now because we don't have the time. But are are there specific uh, uh, redevelopment opportunities um, now? Ones that would sort of be obvious to occur um, in the next. Well, let me say two years. Uh, I, I don't share this nervousness about doing this during the COVID period, and I won't go into why. But those are my two questions, and um, if they could be answered quickly, I, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, I, I can begin and um, also let housing staff uh, jump in because 
I think it does cover both uh, divisions here. Uh, in our discussions, I think if I would have had to interpret the feedback we received, um, you know, even if this were to go forward, it will still make condo developments utilizing the neighborhood's form-based code still very challenging. Uh, I think if we were to, if our main purpose was to ensure development through that zoning tool would deliver condominium projects, the recommendation will be much closer to the 120% AMI, which is what several have mentioned that it would take something at that level for condominium projects to begin to materialize along Columbia Pike. But because that is not a driver for what we're doing here, and we are very mindful of all the other elements at play that we have to consider, and we've consistently heard uh, from the community, we've researched, um, and just staff's professional opinion, is that we have to be somewhere in the middle. We know that 60% is too low for a number of reasons that have already been stated. We also understand that 120% does not serve the group groups that we need to be really careful of uh, and making sure that they have opportunities in Arlington County and Columbia Pike. So our proposal is exactly in the middle between 80 and 100. Uh, so many of the folks that we've spoken to, I think, have indicated that in addition to raising the AMI, other factors would also have to be at play to ensure flexibility uh, and other accommodations because of how difficult it is to uh, make a condo development feasible uh, anywhere, really, not just Columbia Pike. It's, it, it is not a quarter-wide uh, challenge. Uh, you know, I would also want to highlight that you know, the fact that we uh, continue to, I think, hear concerns that condo developments are coming, I do want to point people and continue to try that the commercial form-based code um, has been in place since 2003. Yeah, that's 17 years worth of opportunities on sites that are primed for redevelopment, typically just improved with single-story retail, fast food restaurants, and those sorts of things that can easily be consolidated and turned into a six-story project. Even in those sites where we have currently, and for the last 17 years, no lead requirement, we have no affordable requirements on site, all those things potentially yielding a very financially feasible project, they have only delivered one condominium project this entire time. So if under, even under those circumstances, it's proving to be difficult. This is why I think staff is feeling confident in that in the neighborhood's form is code, which is much more restrictive and onerous for those property owners, condominium developments are going to need much more than a minor adjustment in the AMI ranges to begin to come knocking through the door because every site now wants to redevelop suddenly. Um, so that's kind of the sentiment of what we heard from the development community, but I also wanted to um, let housing staff kind of weigh in on that. Thank you, Mr. Matusek. Thanks, no, I think you captured that um, perfectly, uh, Matt, and I won't uh, belabor the point. Thanks, Ms. Janowski. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Siegel, did that answer your questions? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Weir. I almost wonder if there's sort of a gentleman's agreement among the development community when they, they look at projects like um, look at places like River Place and they think, well, uh, that's a whole lot of money that none of us are ever going to be able to make because how are you going to get however many thousand people who live at River Place together to, to agree to sell? And so now they're all thinking, well, you know, we're just not going to build condos anymore because that's going to be our dinner 60 years from now. But that's neither... That's, that's baseless speculation. I'm sorry. Uh, I guess I have a question for a staff it sure and, is. Uh, uh, and a comment. Um, uh, what, if any, authority does the county have to, or or is there any precedent in the county for sunsetting uh, amendments to the zoning ordinance, right? So um, I guess the, the sort of hypothetical I'm thinking about, it's not a hypothetical, it's, it's a possibility, is is um, would would there be any basis, any precedent for the, for the county board to adopt this amendment um, uh, and then it would sunset three years from now, thus making it potentially easier to um, sort of by operation of law not be able to, to, to deal with any, if things just run off the rails in terms of condo development. Mr. Matusek? I can take an initial stab at that. Um, while 
sunset clauses are not unprecedented, even in the neighborhood's farm based code, where I think it might actually have the opposite of the intended impact here is that they tend to kind of trigger an expedited consideration of certain sites, knowing that there's only a limited window under which some of these incentives or regulations apply. Uh, so I think we would be very cautious of, I think, taking that route, knowing that that actually itself might trigger some folks to strongly consider this. Um, and perhaps in the absence of that sunset clause, maybe that, that, that would not be the case. So we definitely want to be very mindful of what the impact of that would be uh, on folks that are making that determination. Thanks. So I guess, you know, to my colleagues, I'm, I'm looking at this uh, and I'm seeing, I live very close to that. I, I, every day I, I drive by the um, uh, parcel adjacent to the Barcroft Apartments that, that for a long time was a single family home and, and now is going to be 17 townhouses. And so at least twice a day, every day, I think to myself, we, we lost, I think of the 30 households that aren't going to be able to live there because because we didn't have a, a zoning ordinance in place that made uh, 30, 40, 45, 50 households pencil out. And so now we have now we have 17 places for people to live. Um, and and I can't help but be affected by the public comment and the concerns that we've received. Um, but but when I look at the development patterns and see that there is a, a, nine, a, a nine to one, almost a 10 to one discrepancy between the number of apartment units that are being built and the number of condo units that are being built. And, um, and, and then I read that our current zoning ordinance very, may very well have the effect of, that our current NFBC very, may very well have the effect of effectively preventing uh, uh, um, homes from being built mere dozens at a time. Um, that's, that's really problematic to me, especially because of the very good CAF requirements that exist uh, uh, when it comes to rental units. And um, so I, you know, I, this has been a, a hard one for me, uh, but it's become an easier one as I've, as I've been thinking through this meeting. And, and that's that we just, we're, we have the ability to recommend that the county board, um, we, I mean, I mean, the commission, you know, mindful of the limits of our office, have the ability to recommend that the county board uh, uh, direct staff's particular attention over and above what is normally uh, due to monitoring market trends over the course of the next year or so in case there's a change. But a nine to one or a 10 to one imbalance, that doesn't just change. That doesn't just you know, because of one minor zoning ordinance with respect to uh, uh, AMI thresholds, you don't just go from a nine to one threshold to something other than that. And as long as the buy right developments are causing us to lose, you know, as long as the opportunity cost of a buy right development continues to be, you know, a few dozen homes for people each time, then, uh, you know, this, this seems like an entirely reasonable and very small issue to me. Um, and so I, that's that's where I am right now. Thank you, Commissioner Weir. I want to align my comments with that. As someone who was a former housing coordinator in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, where we faced very similar challenges, this seems very reasonable to me. Um, I want to make sure the rest of our colleagues have an opportunity to speak. Commissioner Bagley, is, did you have a comment or a question? No, do, do I still have my hand up? I'm sorry. Yes, you do. No, oh. no problem. Okay. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, <laughs> any other commissioners with a question or a comment? Not seeing any. Commissioner Weir, are you ready for a motion? Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Morton, then Commissioner Weir. Uh, I just would like to align myself with what Commissioner Weir just said. I think he's... Um, convincing me that this is a small um, 
measure that may have a positive outcome and and hopefully with uh, I, I I'd love to see the additional motion you were discussing um, raised in some form but you know particularly anticipating that I, I think that that you've convinced me to support the motion thank you thank you Commissioner Morton anyone else okay Commissioner Ware Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am going to begin with. I'm going to present two motions. Um, uh, I'm going to read them both so that our colleagues have the benefit of of um, seeing them, and also so that anyone who uh, has decided that they are going to be watching us on YouTube at 10:40 p.m. Um, thank you to those of you who are there. Uh, um, uh, for validating our interest in this, if nothing else, um, so that they know what is is going to be coming. Um, so to be so clear, the, you're going to read them first, and then you'll read yes, them for a yes, second. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, so the the first motion is um, the the county manager's recommended motion. Uh, I, I would move. The, I'm not. I'm not moving this. I'm reading it. I'll come back to it momentarily. Uh, I would move that the planning commission recommends that the county board adopt the ordinance attached uh, to the NFBC 11 staff report to amend, reenact, and recodify the Arlington County Zoning Ordinance Article 11.2, Section 902. You know what? Um, I am going to take a pause here. Is it possible to, I don't see a share, here's a share screen. I'm gonna see if I can share this. Um, can someone give Daniel the I may have the ability to do that. Okay. Um, yep, there you go. We can see it. Let me just get the relevant text here. Um, so uh, I got through this much uh, to adjust the area median income limit for affordable homeownership units from 60% of AMI to uh, new limits that would range up to 80% of AMI and up to 100% of AMI while extending the affordability term for such units and to stipulate standards for condominium conversion of affordable rental units developed under the NFBC. Now this this is the um, county manager's recommended motion. Uh, after we dispense with this and assuming it passes um in fact you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna um mm -hmm. uh, assuming it passes i'm also going to uh, move that the planning commission recommend that the county board direct staff to closely monitor trends in the distribution of new development between rental to uh, rental and condo construction that should say and condo construction and report back annually to the fbc aug the planning commission and the county board um so that being said, um, I'll go back here uh, and I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the County Board adopt the ordinance attached to the Neighborhoods Forum Based Code 11 staff report to amend, reenact, and recodify the Arlington County Zoning Ordinance Article 11.2, Section 908, CPN FBC, Columbia Pike Neighborhoods Forum Based Code Districts Appendix B uh, to adjust the area median income limit for affordable homeownership units. From from 60% of AMI to new limits that range up to 80% of AMI and up to 100% of AMI while extending the affordability term for such units and to stipulate standards for condominium conversion of affordable rental units developed under the NFBC. Commission, um, Commissioner, we have a motion. Uh, second? I would second. Thank you. Seconded by Commissioner Siegel. Any discussion of this motion? I'm looking for a show of hands or unmuted microphone. Commissioner Hughes and then Commissioner Schull. Thank you, Commissioner Gearing. Uh, I first want to say uh, hats off to staff on this one. Uh, they have done an amazing job with their, uh, their extensive outreach to our community. It has been a tremendous show for Akira, Melissa, and Matt, uh, all three of them. Hats off, that's all I'm going to say on that. Um, I agree with staff in a lot of ways. I agree the development pressures will remain, and I agree that uh, achieving ownership units at 60% AMI is an exceptional challenge. And I also believe that there are other creative ways that we can do to solve this, some of which I've brought up this evening. It's for all those reasons and many of the ones expressed by my neighbors on the pike that I will not be supporting this amendment this evening. Um, the, the need uh, for consistency 
with respect to the form based code is extremely important. It is the consistency and the method and the projection of that to our development community that allows for both the neighbors and the harmonious development to continue and to occur. Uh, this, this impact would have a marginal effect. It would not be transformative, but uh, it's for all those reasons that this evening I will not be supporting that motion. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Commissioner Schroll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I intend to um, abstain from the motion. Um, I've been wrestling with this for a little bit. Um, and so um, I see kind of arguments on both sides. And um, I don't think a yes nor a no vote would accurately reflect where I am. Um, and um, I am concerned more about the condo conversion piece of existing um, or future projects under the form-based code and less concerned about the ownership piece. But since they're part of the same package, um, I think my, my decision tonight will be to abstain. I, I do uh, agree with the sentiments, I think, largely of trying to increase home ownership. I just don't necessarily believe that we've um, gotten to the right language yet. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Schroll. Commissioner Weir, did you want to have a final word on your motion? I'll, you know, I'll, I'll just, I think, reiterate that for me, the thing that I care most about is the is the homes, right? And we have a mechanism to get the rental units uh, there. Um, if we don't get more homes, if, if we, you know, there's a, there, I, I guess my, my final thought is, is I would encourage my fellow commissioners to be mindful of the opportunity costs uh, of not getting a, um, a a form-based code development of losing a form-based code development because it because it's either going to be condominium or townhouse and it only pencils out as townhouse and that opportunity cost is you know dozens of units at a time um, so that's I think that's what I'll say. Okay, thank you, um, Commissioner Lynn. Tell me very briefly. We we absolutely have to be off of this at eleven. Commissioner Lynn, tell me. Um, yes, I'm sorry, I was on mute. Um, I, I would just want to associate myself with Commissioner Weir's comments. This has been a very, very difficult decision to make. Um, it's a very complex issue. The um, Those opposing it have very legitimate concerns. Um, I'm still not fully comfortable, but I'm willing to go along. I believe staff has made the, the analysis and the fears I think, while real, I think the staff has raised enough data to ameliorate those concerns in my mind that I'm willing to go along and vote in favor of the motion. Thank you, Commissioner Lantami. Okay, with that, we were, we're ready to take our vote. I'll go in the same order for the other motions. Commissioner Lantami? Aye. Commissioner Bagley? Yeah, Commissioner Bagley? You're muted. Abstain. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Hughes? No. Commissioner Morton? Aye. Commissioner Patel? Nay. Commissioner Peterson? Nay. Commissioner Sarley? Aye. Commissioner Schroll? Abstain. Commissioner Siegel? Aye. Commissioner Steinberger? Nay. Commissioner Weir? Aye. Commissioner Guerin? Aye. So that is six ayes, two abstentions, four noes. <laughs> Commissioner Schroll? Madam Chair, uh, a Does tie that... does not pass. Thank you. Under Robert's rules, a tie is a failure. You knew exactly what I was going to ask you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to share. I yes. um, I'm going to continue this though, uh, and and I think that I'm, with with a very small change, um, I would move then that the planning commission recommend uh, that 
uh, sh that, that should the county board adopt the proposed amendment that it direct staff to closely monitor trends in the distribution of new development between rental and condo construction and report back annually to the uh, FBC AUG, the PC and the county board. Second. I'll second that. Uh, motion by Commissioner Ware, seconded by Commissioner Guerin. Uh, we'll go through and we'll take a vote on that one. Commissioner Lantelmi? Aye. Commissioner Bagley? Abstain. Got it. Commissioner Hughes? Abstain. Commissioner Morton? Aye. Commissioner Patel? Abstain. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sarley? Aye. Commissioner Schroll? Aye. Commissioner Siegel? Aye. Commissioner Steinberger? Aye. Commissioner Weir? Aye. Commissioner Guerin? Aye. Um, that passes nine ayes to three abstentions. And with that, I believe we are done with this item. I want to thank the members of the public, Mr. Snyder, Mr. Berkey, Ms. Bodine, Mr. Spain, and Mr. Nixon for your time in speaking tonight. You can see that we take your concerns very seriously. I want to thank staff, Ms. Donowski, Ms. Brown, and Mr. Machusek for your patience tonight. Um, this was a good discussion. I know we are not always all happy with the outcomes of these votes, but I think you have some good feedback going forward. And I want to thank our Zoco chairs, um, Commissioners Weir and Commissioners Patel, and also Commissioner Hughes for representing the AUG. Madam Clerk, would you please call the next item? Yes. Um, our next item is the PC committee reports and other business. Thank you. Per my email earlier in the week, we are not doing oral committee reports tonight. We simply don't have enough time. Uh, what we do have to do is approve our September meeting minutes. May I get a motion? Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. I uh, move adoption of our meeting minutes from uh, our September meeting. Thank you, second. Commissioner. Is that second, Commissioner Steinberger? It was. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Schull, remind me how I can do this easily. Um, Madam Chair, just ask if there are any um, changes or edits, and then if not, then ask for roll, and anybody who did not attend that meeting should abstain. Um, are there any edits or changes to the minutes? Seeing none, um, I guess I'll go through and, and I'll get the, the vote again. Commissioner Lantelmi? Aye. Commissioner Bagley? Please Aye. abstain if you were not in attendance. Thank you. Commissioner Hughes? Aye. Commissioner Morton? Aye. Commissioner Patel? Aye. Commissioner Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Sarley? Aye. Commissioner Schroll? Aye. Commissioner Siegel? Aye. Commissioner Steinberger? Aye. Commissioner Weir? Aye. Commissioner Guerin? Aye. Minutes pass. Thank you. Um, I want to just take a moment and thank everybody. I want to thank my colleagues for their leadership on the various components of our role and responsibility. Commissioner Lantelmi, thank you very much for your timely and very important changes to our bylaws. Commissioner Schroll, for your guidance on the various LRPCs underway and your help with the Roberts Rules of Order. Commissioners Weir, Patel, and Hughes on the zoning change issue before us tonight. And Commissioners Morton and Siegel for um, Park Arlington. Um, the SPRC, let's continue to rely on and work with each other to facilitate our thorough and thoughtful community engagement. Thank you to our staff tonight, to the applicants and members of the public for your time, consideration, and patience this evening. Items heard this evening are expected to go to the county board on October 17th and 20th. Planning Commissioner Steinberger will represent the PC at these county board hearings. Many staff labored to make this virtual meeting run smoothly. Thanks to all of you, and special thanks to our clerk, Ms. Johnson, and our SPRC supervisor, Matt Pfeiffer. As always, it's my honor to work with all of you. Tonight, uh, Commissioner Peterson got five points for using the word eggplant in her comments. Congratulations. And with this, <coughs> our commission stands adjourned <laughs> until November. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, Chairman Gearing. Thank you, everybody. See you next <laughs> month. Bye. See everybody next week. Or next week, even. Take next care. Week.